Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to be there. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you the first webinar uh, that our FIM working group uh, on uh, telemedicine and uh, um, uh, innovation and uh, digital health uh, is, uh, is pre has prepared for, uh, for you. And um, let's start with a, a small introduction of the webinar because I want to uh, that uh, you uh, that the speaker has the time to present all the these important topics uh, that prepare for us. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, our webinar and uh, the topics are uh, very important because uh, is, uh, uh, we propose to you an unexpected journey on health. And um, uh, these are a little bit the, our, uh, the presentation of our group is a new group. It was born uh, uh, this year. And uh, the purpose of our uh, working group on telemedicine, innovative technologies and digital health uh, is to select the best practices about uh, telemedicine and uh, innovative technologies and digital health, uh, both in Europe and in the world, and focused on uh, internal medicine units. Uh, with the objective to increase the quality of care and the reduction uh, um, uh, of the uh, length of stay in uh, of our patient. Uh, the duration of our working group is from uh, 2021 to 2025. And we want to create a common language and among all AFI members. It's for that that we choose to start with the, with the webinar. Uh, to highlight also best practices in the field of telemedicine, uh, innovation technology and digital health, to do also operational research project, uh, and also to set up a framework on telemedicine in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the objective of this, uh, of this uh, uh, webinar is to create a common language because we decided all together that it was very important at the beginning uh, to clarify uh, the topics and uh, to have a common language and also to highlight the best practices in the field of telemedicine, innovation technology and digital health and also the, the objective of this, uh, of this uh, webinar is to lay the foundation for pre the preparation of a position paper on telemedicine, innovative technologies and digital health in internal medicine. Uh, it's for that that the contribution of Professor Kuhn is, I think is very important to, to draw, to, to continue in this, in this uh, to realize this objective. Um, I, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, e-health, we, we find a lot of uh, words, a lot of uh, concepts, and these are really very complex. It's, it's very important to have a common language. We talk about e-health governance, m-health, electronic health records, digital health literacy, uh, standard and interoperability, telehealth, big data, social network. So, um, I hope that during this webinar, uh, it will um, it will be clarified the the meaning of each of these items, these important topics, and um, also it's very important that it is growing the uh, the importance of the com uh, digital competencies for doctors and uh, in, in terms of digital, uh, general digital skills, uh, technical digital skills, and also patient-doctor relationship, how it, it change with the, the use of uh, all the new technology we, uh, we, could, we, we could have in this, in this era. And also it's very, it's clear that after uh, enduring a COVID pandemic, this, uh, uh, this issue is, uh, is growing and uh, the, the need to use, uh, uh, to increase our digital competency is, uh, is really important in this moment. 
So uh, the program is to, to talk about telemedicine, innovation and, and artificial intelligence and digital health. Um, and we want to clarify what we are talking about, the main experiences in Europe and uh, in the world and the future perspective. And we ask the, the speakers to explain us uh, these three important uh, topics, uh, on, on these three important topics, uh, the meaning of these three uh, arguments. And so uh, have a good study and uh, let's start with the, with the first section of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Ah, the, the, the other thing that I want to say is that we decided uh, to, to have the, the question after each session. So at the end of the section, the, the moderator will ask you to, to, to make the questions and we, you can do it both in, in, the, in the writing way. So we, you can chat your, uh, your question and we will answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philomena. My name is Klaus Vogelmeier. I'm working at the University Hospital of Marburg in Germany. Um, and I have the pleasure to chair the first part of this meeting. And this is about telemedicine. Um, my co-chair is Olivia Brayar. I'm not sure if she is with us today. I, at least I don't see her name on the panel. Oh, it's, it, she, she's not there because it, it was not possible for her to, to stay here. He is okay. abroad. So you, you chair alone, but you are strong, very strong, so no problem. <laughs> I will survive. Um, for those of you who, want, who have questions, uh, please use the, the, the Q&A section at the bottom uh, to, to, to write down your questions so that we can discuss this after the first two presentations. So the first presentation has the title telemedicine what are we talking about so it's kind of a defining presentation and it will be given by Yarika Yerviste from Estonia please Yarika hello everyone uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today uh, I will try to shine some light on this confusion which uh, is amongst the ter uh, different terms. Uh, now you should see the full screen of yes. my presentation. Yes. Uh, so telemedicine, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, I'll do my best uh, to shine some light on it. Uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a project manager for telemedicine development in Estonian Health Insurance Fund. Uh, but uh, I am uh, I have a degree in medicine from Tartu University. Uh, I practiced internal medicine as a medical resident of uh, internal medicine in North Estonia Medical Center and also in the University Hospital of Carl Gustav Garus in Dresden, Germany. And uh, uh, and recently. Uh, uh, I decided uh, to change from uh, practicing medicine to uh, innovate uh, or participate in the innovating pro uh, procedure of the healthcare system. Uh, and the main reasons uh, were seeing every day how we uh, desperately need new and innovative models of care to first increase the patient centricity to provide patients with more convenient, timely, and better quality healthcare services, and the second, uh, uh, the second reason for my uh, career change was to increase efficiency, uh, in uh, uh, to to widen the possibilities uh, to help patients uh, the way they need, not the way that we are we as healthcare specialists uh, are used to. And uh, to get uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, subject of telemedicine going, I, this is one of my favorite citations from, uh, from a guy named Mark Britnell, uh, who is a worldwide uh, healthcare uh, systems expert, uh, familiar with over 80 of them all over the world. 
And he says that work smarter, not harder. And how uh, is that re uh, relevant uh, in terms of telemedicine? Uh, let me explain. Uh, so we all have heard about the aging population problem and increasing demand on the healthcare sector. We in Estonia are struggling with 24% uh, of our uh, um, primary care physicians uh, being over the retirement age. And we know that this problem uh, is going to grow uh, and uh, only by uh, educating more healthcare specialists, we will not be able to uh, cover uh, the demand. Uh, so, uh, Mark Pridnell, the guy I was talking about, uh, has come up with 10 uh, different ways on how to tackle the issue of, uh, uh, of the workforce crisis that he's, um, uh, he's saying is going to be, we're, we're going to be lacking 20% of the healthcare, as, um, healthcare workforce uh, by 2030. And here are the 10 measures uh, he sees as uh, part of the a potential solution and uh, new uh, care models uh, are one of them. Uh, and so much for the introduction. Uh, now let's get to uh, telemedicine, uh, which literally means uh, uh, healing at distance. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has come with uh, come up with the definitions you can see on this slide. Uh, but um, when they came up with this in 2008, before that they uh, found uh, 104 uh, peer-reviewed uh, articles with different uh, definitions of telemedicine, which means it can be. Uh, confusing at first, but I think this definition is uh, uh, does uh, pretty uh, pretty well describe uh, from different perspectives what telemedicine means. So, it's the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor uh, by all healthcare professionals, by not not only doctors uh, but all healthcare professionals. Uh, using information and com communication technologies uh, for uh, information exchange and information and communication technologies that includes everything from telephones, internet uh, applications, uh, so anything you could imagine. Um, and the purpose of telemedicine uh, is uh, uh, for diagnostic purposes, treatment, prevention, uh, and disease and uh, in, uh, injuries. So uh, uh, that pretty much covers all aspects of the definition. And what needs to be um, also to be mentioned is that the telemedicine is uh, synonymous to telehealth uh, and also remote healthcare services. They can be sometimes differentiated, but uh, uh, usually they mean the same and I think we for the clarification of definitions and uh, mm, uh, different names that we're using we need to agree on what uh, we're referring to uh, when talking about one or the other. So telemedicine and telehealth uh, and remote healthcare services in my presentation are the same thing. Uh, okay, and also to give some uh, uh, perspective, uh, here's a slide, a very simple slide, uh, which uh, which shows you how uh, I've come to understand uh, the uh, definitions and the meanings of different uh, uh, different words that also Philomena uh, mentioned. So e-health is like a rooftop uh, um, word. Uh, it basically involves everything to do with uh, uh, information communication technologies and uh, uh, medicine. So every point where these two meet. And digital health provides uh, the necessary uh, tools uh, for e-health to um, exist or to work. So digital health basically means the uh, applications, the uh, different uh, uh, different uh, tools that are needed to 
um, provide uh, e-health services. And telemedicine is one part uh, of the e-health system. Uh, there are also electronic health records, medical records, mHealth, all IT system, patient data management. So all terms we can come up with are here under the uh, roof uh, uh, top uh, uh, word uh, e-health. And when we zoom in uh, into telemedicine, uh, then there can be uh, different uh, uh, ways uh, to go on from there. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, the one of the most common uh, ways of uh, uh, differentiating uh, different telemedicine types. So synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, communication um, ways. Uh, and this here are uh, the uh, this slide shows the um, possible uh, telemedicine uh, solutions between specialist and the patient. Uh, but the World Health Organization definition also includes uh, under telemedicine uh, the different solutions that uh, um, enable communication between different two different specialists. And basically, the same scheme could be drawn uh, for specialist specialist. Uh, uh, interactions. Uh, but specialist patient-wise, then synchronous uh, telemedicine uh, uh, distributes as teleconsultations, teletherapy and remote monitoring. I will be talking about all three of them uh, a little bit uh, more specifically. And teleconsultations then again are divided into uh, video consultations, telephone consultations and uh, messaging or chat uh, by the means of how teleconsultation is delivered. And uh, asynchronous uh, communication uh, in remote health or asynchronous remote healthcare services provision uh, is uh, mainly uh, by messaging and that can be via email or via chat. Uh, and also uh, remote monitoring is, you can see here that it's under uh, both sections. And this is uh, because remote monitoring is a very wide uh, term. And, um, and we can, in, in ter when it's used in real time and the uh, healthcare specialist gets real time information, then it's uh, synchronous, but uh, there can be solutions that are uh, kept an, that the specialists keep an eye on once a week, once a day, once a week, uh, once every how many weeks. So it can also be uh, asynchronous. Uh, so the big question why, uh, before I go uh, to more specifically to the subtypes I was talking about, is because telemedicine makes it easier for the patients to stay on track of their health. And if it's easier for the patients to stay on track, it's more convenient. Uh, that uh, means that patients are uh, have better compliance with the treatment. Uh, and uh, they also are willing to take bigger responsibility uh, for their health. So by making healthcare services more uh, person-centered, uh, we will uh, be achieving uh, uh, the known goals we have, but uh, and we are talking about all the time, uh, um, uh, we, that, that will enable us that. Uh, and also uh, telemedicine uh, can uh, give us uh, uh, or um, widen uh, the regional availability of healthcare services. It can provide equal options for patients. Uh, internal medicine wise, uh, that could mean, for example, remote monitoring after the acute hospitalization uh, episode and to get the patient uh, home faster where he feels uh, uh, better. But then again, we're not gonna lose the patient. We will be able to monitor uh, his or her uh, um, health indicators from distance and we will be able to react as soon as it's uh, needed or earlier than it would be when uh, he's sent home without uh, home monitoring or uh, teleconsultation uh, possibilities. And the last point is uh, patient journey, which can be more flexible. Uh, patients can receive uh, many healthcare services near home 
uh, they will be better compliant uh, with their uh, care plan. Uh, and then that again will lead us to better uh, health outcomes. Uh, so a little bit about Estonian uh, experience. Uh, uh, we, uh, just for you to know uh, that uh, I have a sense about what I'm talking about. Um, in March 2020, uh, we launched teleconsultations uh, in secondary care. So all different specialists uh, were allowed to do teleconsultations via video, telephone or chat. Uh, and, could, and, uh, and those services were paid uh, equal to face-to-face -face consultations. Uh, then we quickly realized that uh, this can't be the end of our uh, telemedicine development process. Uh, to, uh, there is a need for remote monitoring solutions. Uh, and we launched a pilot project competition uh, in, in last fall. I will uh, shortly uh, be staying on that in, uh, in a few slides. Uh, we uh, did uh, work out the regulations and funding for teletherapy in January 21. Uh, so these uh, uh, therapies also can be uh, done uh, via uh, telemedicine solutions. And we also have uh, come up with a consultation bonus to uh, get the healthcare providers uh, concentrate more on video consultations, use uh, video instead of telephone. Uh, and mainly the reason is because there's better trust between patient and a doctor when they can see each other. And that has been the uh, feedback from both uh, patients and uh, professionals. So I promised to say a few words about each subtype of uh, telemedicine uh, that I described. Uh, first, then teleconsultation which is a remote consultation between a specialist and a patient, and by means of a secure uh, in, uh, information and communication technology solution. And teleconsultation is a synchronous uh, communication between parties via telephone, video, uh, uh, or uh, web chat. Mm, um, to put it very uh, easily, it's just an al alternative way of providing care uh, that by principle remains the same as face-to-face -face, uh, consultations. And uh, we did um, form a few regulations uh, on um, basically centrally uh, on country level, uh, but uh, there are other countries that uh, by specialist organizations have um, uh, more specific uh, regulations or in, uh, in, um, instructions for the specialists to choose uh, patients who are um, um, who are uh, ready for teleconsultation. There are very many things to consider, but we've uh, let the professionals so far decide uh, what uh, can be handled via teleconsultation and what cannot. And so far, the patient's uh, satisfaction rate is. Uh, uh, is high and also the professionals uh, uh, are happy with it. Uh, if there comes up a need uh, for more specific rules, uh, then these probably will need to be worked out by specialist groups. Uh, then uh, teletherapy, uh, which is the provision of therapeutic healthcare services remotely. Uh, this is uh, a definition that we came up with here in Estonia. Uh, teletherapy as a wider term has been used in very many different ways, um, also in radiology or, or different areas. But uh, uh, what I'm talking about here is, uh, is teletherapy as uh, speech therapy, uh, as um, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, clinical uh, psychology. And uh, this actually can also be used exactly the same way as teleconsultations as an alternative to face-to-face -to -face, uh, services, uh, but uh, here supportive materials, uh, uh, do-it-yourself at home uh, materials are, uh, would be very useful and we're working on um, creating those. Also, the specialist organizations have uh, 
uh, worked a lot on instructions for uh, these specialists in those areas. And the main uh, bonuses are that patients can be evaluated in their everyday environment. Uh, it's pretty much the same for remote monitoring in each uh, uh, aspect, uh, like uh, uh, remote um, blood pressure monitoring, for example. We all know that uh, the uh, outcomes in a doctor's uh, office or home uh, can be very different. So we can see the everyday environment of the patients and also therapy is more available, flexible, cost efficient, uh, and the patients are more compliant to, uh, to it. Uh, now the most um, uh, difficult maybe of the uh, subtypes I was talking about is remote monitoring. Uh, the definition is most uh, unclear. Uh, we can say that it's monitoring patient health indicators from distance uh, using a different uh, uh, information communication technology solutions. Uh, here are endless opportunities and it has a huge potential in continuous uh, exacerbation preventive chronic disease uh, monitoring uh, for different indicators. Uh, but here, uh, um, widespread use of the solutions uh, is more complicated. There's no one size fits all. It's very um, um, diagnosis dependent, uh, patient dependent, patient compliance with digital solutions dependent. Uh, so uh, it can benefit uh, our patients and ourselves a lot, but then again, it can be very hard in some areas and confusing. So in a sense of remote monitoring, uh, the definition, the regulations and the funding are right now being tested all over the world, mainly project-based uh, testing. Uh, and uh, we will be uh, having uh, much more informations, uh, information uh, basically every day, there's something new um, coming up. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's uh, difficult to uh, regulate, uh, for example, uh, um, remote monitoring uh, um, at first. Uh, so what we in Estonia uh, decided to do is to uh, call for action for pilot projects. Uh, and we uh, just last month have uh, chosen the last uh, in the second round for pilot projects. Uh, to test uh, out different uh, remote monitoring uh, options. And, um, and these projects will be running for two years now. Uh, if anyone's interested, then from the slides, uh, you can read more about it uh, or ask more about it. But uh, I would go on uh, for another uh, lecture uh, with these uh, uh, solutions. Uh, yeah, and we're trying to test out the, um, we're trying to evaluate the outcome, uh, also the clinical, but also as important uh, in terms of telemedicine is the user experience, the patient and the professionals from the patient and the professional side, and also the cost efficiency. And we're trying out uh, different uh, funding options uh, also. So uh, a lot of things that we want to achieve with that competition. We'll see how it turns out. And the last idea I would like to share with you is uh, that patient feedback uh, is, is essential uh, in, for new service uh, development. That's in terms of telemedicine, that's in terms of all uh, other uh, new services uh, too. And uh, we've been doing this from the first day, we've been collecting patient feedback from the first day that we launched uh, teleconsultations. Uh, uh, and that's basically the only way uh, or the best way we can get quick uh, but adequate uh, answers uh, uh, or overview how the new services uh, are, uh, are going. And it's especially uh, important in the situation where the available literature is limited, which is the case for the uh, many telemedicine solutions today. It's easier for, uh, for simple solutions like teleconsultation, which only is a matter of uh, uh, the delivery way 
for the service, but uh, it comes into question very much uh, with uh, more complicated solutions. And here is an ex uh, example from our patient satisfaction uh, questionnaire. Uh, so the first two, uh, it's the satisfaction rate with uh, teleconsultations and the first two bars indicate uh, the people who were totally satisfied or uh, partially uh, or rather satisfied with the, um, with the service. And uh, basically that's just illustrative. We can look behind it. We can see uh, it in terms of different healthcare providers and uh, uh, give feedback to them. And then again, create a circle of uh, um, developing the service in the way that, uh, that, uh, that it turns out where it needs developing. Uh, so in terms of all new, um, uh, new service models, I think patient feedback is the thing. And this also uh, probably very many of you have heard of PROMS and PREMS, which can be also uh, used here with new uh, telemedicine uh, service models. So in conclusion, I have three points uh, I wanna stress once uh, more. Uh, we need to look at new ways of delivering care. Uh, to manage the increasing demand in healthcare. I think that is inevitable. Uh, now the question is not uh, should we, but the question is how do we do it? How's the best way? Uh, and that's what we need to be working on. Uh, telemedicine offers flexibility, uh, convenience and lower costs for the patients uh, if targeted and managed correctly. So the possibilities are endless, but we need to use it in the correct manner uh, to get the most out of it. And third, uh, the patient feedback is a very valuable tool that we are just uh, beginning to uh, know how to use. And it's especially uh, useful where the literature's uh, still li limited. Thank you very much. That's it from my side. Thank you, Erika. That was a great start. Um, you gave sort of the whole part of the session some kind of order, and that's very important because that's a lot of that stuff is very confusing. The second speaker is Sebastian Kuhn from Germany, and uh, he has a huge topic to cover. And the title reads Main Perspectives in Europe and the World and Future Perspectives. So we'll see how you're doing. <laughs> Please, Sebastian. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to give this presentation here today. And medicine in the digital age and um, the underlying perspectives in Europe, around the world, and what will happen in the future, it's a huge topic. And I think I can only touch some points I think that are important to me and that uh, might be important to you. I know a lot of you are already experienced in, in the digital transformation in telemedicine and uh, I think it's a good um, opportunity for exchange and I'm looking forward for the discussions after the talk. So um, there are quite a lot of things that push our digital transformation currently forward and I would like to start with that and, and think uh, what are the drivers that actually change medicine at the moment that lead to the digital transformation. And um, giving a talk, I think, uh, in front of you today with a lot of Italians also present, uh, most of you might remember that scene and it's basically the image that was taken when um, Pope Benedict XVI stepped in front of the uh, Peter's Dome and, uh, and showed himself to, to the people gathering there. And that was in 2005. And the next image is a few years later with Pope, um, Pope Francis. And I think those two images, which were taken at the same moment, at the same place, um, just a few years apart, they show us what actually happened to society when it comes to digital transformation. And for you and I, um, for all of us who are working as doctors, those people are not only our fellow citizens, but they are also our patients. And for them, a lot of the digital transformation has already become a reality in their everyday life, how they communicate, how they interact, how they share information, how they gather information. And actually uh, this change has a huge impact for us um, in medicine and how we drive um, the transformation in medicine and the health space forward. So I think um, 
basically the leading people actually pushing the digital transformation forward are the patients. And uh, most patients um, actually gather information about problems, about symptoms they experience before actually seeing us as doctors. So in Germany, there's a, a pretty good um, evaluation. About 70% of the patients are gathering information before they see a doctor or after they see a doctor. And um, nowadays, basically, the diagnostic process doesn't start necessarily at the emergency room or the doctor's office, but actually it starts on Google, it starts on the internet, and patients are, are referring to those resources first. And I think this will have a huge impact because a lot of those uh, technology companies such as Google or Apple are very, very much interested in the health space and, and basically getting involved in there. And we'll see later in the talk a few experiences that are already present nowadays. So uh, the diagnostic process starts on the internet nowadays. And when you look at other digital transformation processes in other industries, such in the music industry or the film industry, um, those tech companies try to reach their customers um, without the usual suspects in that space. And in, in our regard, for Google or Apple, our patients are their customers and they want to approach them directly. And this will have a huge impact on, um, on, on our healthcare system and on our medicine. So I would like to um, come to a second driver of transformation and that is actually technology itself. Mm -hmm. And that picture is from 1987 from a computer expo in Germany. And I was actually there as a, as a young kid, my, my dad took me there and I actually uh, got the chance to use, um, use that brand new technology that was still in the lab space. And it's basically a video conferencing, it's in 1987. And the prime use case was, um, except for business, was healthcare that, uh, that they discussed. And when we fast forward uh, many years, um, this uh, looks still quite similar. And we know from, from the last year, um, kind of like video conferencing in, in the doctor-patient relationship has become quite popular. But this is not really what I think about when I think about telemedicine. This is a very limited approach to it. And it's a bit following kind of like the, the pattern by copying something um, just with a new technology. So you take something old, you add something to it and you think it's something new. And I think this is not really true. And uh, telemedicine is much more than just pure video conferencing. I think um, we heard from Yarika a lot of good examples and already the, uh, the systematic of separating them. But I think overall the, the telemedicine term is vastly expanding and, and there's a lot of different aspects of telemedicine that you can see video conferencing, uh, mobile health integration um, and, and many technologies. So a lot of the things we see are basically the merging of separate technologies to, um, to a remote patient care. And this includes usually a communication part such as video conferencing, or, or chat function. It nowadays also includes a lot of monitoring, a lot of sensors, while uh, basically the video conferencing helps us to communicate, to do our history taking and our communication with the patient. Those sensors which are um, with the patient either on the outside or more and more also in the inside help us to do the investigation. And a lot of those um, um, technologies will be coupled with um, intelligence systems or artificial intelligence to help us um, to, to control the amount of data and to draw conclusions from it. So I think when we think about telemedicine, telehealth, it's a lot of the merging of different technologies into one. And uh, why is that important? It's, it's um, not about copying something old, but it's really about providing better care getting a better insight where the problems are. And when we think about classical healthcare data, we have like single measurements um, at given times. And with digital medicine, we are moving towards a more continuous uh, monitoring, a lot of more data points where we can draw conclusions from. Um, kind of like the Apple Watch is a prime example uh, for that. And um, we already saw some 
um, some aspects where it helps to detect um, arrhythmias, which might not be um, permanently present. Um, this technology was basically introduced um, into more than 40 million devices just by a software update. And we see also a lot of those um, technologies used now under COVID-19 for the detection of, um, of infections where we uh, can see through heart rate variability, um, um, a prime indicator for an acute COVID-19 infection. So when we think about uh, where we normally gather this information that we use for patient care, um, and where this, um, where this data is acquired, we're moving away from the typical hospital or clinic or, or practice setting into the patient's home and even beyond the patient's home to wherever the patient is. So data can be acquired, or medical data can be acquired throughout the day, throughout the year, everywhere the patient is. And we think about by whom is the medicine data or the health data recorded normally it's by the doctors or by the healthcare professionals, and we're moving to patients recording data on themselves or even beyond that into an automated um, response. So digital or telemedicine relies a lot of, on, on the patients and automated recording and moves way beyond the hospital or the different clinics. So, um, this is an image and you won't be able to see all the sub aspects, but I think for me, this is um, one of the most important images I've seen in the last year. And it's basically from the HWO at the conclusion of basically what makes um, the health of a human being. And we can see um, actually the prime um, area which defines the health of a patient is not actually the medical care what we do but actually the individual behavior of the patients so depending on um, which kind of activity they have if they move what the diet is what, what their sleep is what their risk behavior is is actually the prime indicator for for health but also circum uh, social circumstances. We saw that a lot during the COVID-19 crisis, but also we know that from, from other disease, it matters where people live, what social network they have, and also uh, the physical environment, which is top green area, kind of like um, what pollution, what allergens they're exposed to has also um, an important aspect. And this data nowadays is not so much recorded anymore by, by us as healthcare professionals, but very much at a very fine granularity by the digital companies such as Apple and Google. They're investigating how is our behavior, how is our emotion, how many steps did I take, how, what do I consume, um, do I sleep at night or do I look at my mobile phone 20 times throughout the night. They know if I slept, how I moved, who I socialized with, what my social standard is, how my allergen pollution is or the, the, the pollution in general by my GPS location. So they're really gathering this data together and they're moving it into a lot of information which is really emerging into digital biomarkers that can be used for diagnostic purposes. Um, a good example is the, the heart rate variability with the COVID-19 infections but also the response um, towards new pharmacotherapies or prediction for risks such as an onset of long COVID um, with the combination of this different risk factors. And by combining digital biomarkers with classical biomarkers, um, you can uh, get, go more and more towards personalized and predictive medicine. So, um, and the last uh, driver of transformation is basically something that we are undergoing now for more than one year. Crisis has always been a major driver for, for change. And crisis does not only stand for, the, uh, the Greek term crisis does not only stand for drama or conflict or collapse, but also the point where new decisions are made, where we have a choice for something better, where we have a choice to dispute and discuss and to, to change really a system. So I think, um, this is actually what we're undergoing through this crisis, uh, which has been a huge burden on, on, on a lot of people, is actually also an opportunity that we have to change medicine and to change the healthcare system. Um, Li Wen Liang uh, was, was the doctor who was uh, the first one who had the, um, the idea that basically uh, what was ongoing, um, he was a doctor at one hospital, that this could be an, an, an infectious problem. And he was an eye doctor seeing patients and what he 
realized that there were patients um, who had this unclear respiratory problem. And he posted a text message into a WeChat group uh, he shared with his, um, his colleagues from medical school. And his first message was on December 30th um, saying, seven confirmed cases of SARS were reported to hospital from one seafood market. And he added a CT image to it and a hospital report and posted an hour later that this has been confirmed that the coronavirus infection, but it's probably a different subtype than before what we knew from SARS. And it was actually the first um, official information um, that was out there that we could have an infectious disease. What actually happened one day later was that Blue Dot, and that's an artificial intelligence company, which gathers a lot of data and, and combines it with, um, with a lot of other data about where people are, if there are outbreaks, uh, um, what happens at different hospital facilities, but also how uh, patients move or people move around. They actually issued a warning saying um, we have a high suspicion for an, an epidemia outbreak and they warned more than 20 uh, governments in Southeast Asia, but also in Canada and all of the airlines in, in the Southeast Asia um, region one day after the, uh, that post uh, from Dr. Uh, ben Liang. And they predicted the outbreak that actually became true um, in the last, in the following weeks. And uh, they used it through different technology. They basically used artificial intelligence, but also kind of like this uh, chat information that was uh, put out there. And they pretty precisely predicted um, the distribution and the, uh, the change into a pandemic um, already on uh, December 31st. And that was more than a week before uh, the World Health Organization or the CDC published that. So why did I um, want to address that? I think very early on already, we see that there's a difference between the established um, way of information and warning, such as the CDC or the World Health Organization. And um, we see um, that actually became quite relevant and actually was also uh, later more and more picked up by different areas. The other thing, we really did have a change um, in, in medicine, a, a paradigm shift, um, I think last uh, year in, in March. And I was uh, still involved very much in, in the emergency response at the University Medical Center in Mainz at that time and um, reorganizing the emergency department and, and also rethinking the, the surgical ICU. And there was a really a shift in medicine and because it was always true when you're sick, um, go see a doctor. And uh, last year in March, with all the information that we had from, from Northern Italy, from the Alsace, from, from China, this really changed. And, um, and suddenly we went to remote care and patients were instructed to drive to a supermarket and parking lot to get tested there. And a general practitioner would call them and take care from a distance with a technology that's, that was more than 100 years old. And for me at that point, I knew that we were having trouble identifying the patients who were safe to stay at home and the patients we really want to see in the emergency room or we would have to take care in hospital or in the ICU. So um, for me last year in, in March, um, I had the idea, and I think a few other people also had that, that we needed to include remote patient monitoring because um, telecare or telemedicine by a telephone was not good enough to, to realize like silent hypoxia or the, de the deterioration of patients going into a viral pneumonia. And so what we did basically, we developed a smartphone application which for one was able to integrate sensors through Bluetooth for um, especially uh, oxygen saturation, temperature, and also um, the cardiac parameters. And we also included in the smartphone app and a simple interface so patients could document their symptoms and also were able to report um, standard outcomes in the follow-up. And we combined that with a simple um, telemedicine platform that could be accessible for, for all different uh, doctors just through a web interface. And um, 
from that, um, Professor Vogelmeier and I collaborated together with a few of our colleagues and actually turned it into a national project that's ongoing at the moment, where we, for one, look after acute patients um, in combination with general practitioners and emergency rooms, supported by outreach teams and university hospitals. But now also as the pandemic changes, we're also looking after long COVID patients to identify them um, in, their, in their inability and, and their disability um, by including more uh, sensors for peak flow and also overall activity and also a psychological screening. And also combine that again with general practitioner, specialist rehab centers and the university outreach teams. And at the same time, while we try to optimize individual patient care, we, um, we start to build a research a database because we know those biomarkers might be helpful later on to identify patients more early. So I think this is a pretty good example of how we can change um, telemed or we combine like telemedicine, mobile health, telemonitoring into, into a project. So digital transformation, a lot of people say this is a humongous change. This is like a paramount experience. This is unheard of. This has never happened before. And a lot of also of our colleagues feel overwhelmed. And I, I like to look back in history and think, what can we learn from previous transformation, transformation processes? Medicine has always been an area where new technologies were translated into a new patient care, a patient care that was better for our patient. And I think the prime technology of the last century was actually the introduction of X-rays. X-rays were invented by a physicist, um, Röntgen, and uh, the first X-ray that was taken in 1899 was the left hand of, uh, of his wife. But it took quite a while until this technological innovation was translated into a purposeful patient treatment. X-ray in the early, 90, uh, early 1900s was a lot of an amusement. You could go to an amusement park and have X-rays taken of you just for fun. And it, um, his invention was, was recognized quite early on and the implication, but still took thousands um, millions of doctors to translate it into everyday practice. A new professions aroused, new skills um, became a core requirement for all doctors. And I think from this transformation process, we can learn that technology has to be translated into medical diagnostic procedures and also medical treatment procedures and new professions and new core requirements for all doctors arise from that. And I think we have to, we have to learn from that and understand that the introduction of digital technology is not so much a technological revolution, but really um, a translation of our own profession, of our everyday acting as doctors. So I would like to come towards the end of my talk and offer a few perspectives that I think that might be important looking forward. I think the post-COVID situation will not be the pre-COVID situation. We're not going back to where we were two years ago in medicine. And um, a lot of our patients have become very much accustomed to uh, tele telemedicine, telecare. Um, in France, there was 25-fold increase in remote consultations during the first pandemic wave. Um, when it comes to psychotherapy, there was even an increase by 4,000% in, in Germany um, to do this remotely. So I think we're, we're going, we're changing again. Of course, this will not um, stay at the same level, but we're not going back to the original levels. And also digital application on the smartphone in Germany are now prescribable and they, they represent a very vast area, not only what we had with the sensors, but also um, digital therapies and all different, uh, different kinds of applications. And the third one, I think the general population is getting more used, but also general doctors are getting more used to rely on data and large data files to, for decision-making. And this will be an ongoing process. It will be an ongoing learning process. We're not going to uh, go back to 2019. 
Um, so when we think about um, before the pandemic, kind of like telemedicine, virtual care, digital therapies and digital diagnostic was only the exemption, it will be a process of change and actually it will be a standard uh, part of care, of the, of the chain of care. And in some areas, physical will be, will be a stepped process where you might start with a virtual or a telecare first. So this is, um, I think, the, the perspective for, for the next few years. But the other thing is also, I think digital medicine, like I mentioned, it's not just the introduction of some technology. I think just to use a standard process and add technology does not really lead to, uh, to an optimized care. We have to rethink medicine and we have to, to use different information, more information for our patients. And I think a very good example, um, this is not from internal medicine, this is from dermatology, but it was just published last week, is um, basically how Google is introducing now um, an, an application uh, where patients can uh, contract their skin conditions, for example. And um, what you basically do is you take, an, you take an image or multiple images of a skin lesion and you add some information like a structured um, history taking observation and they use artificial intelligence. They basically use their, their algorithms that they also use for Google images to do the analysis and they, they have huge data platforms to analyze it. And things like that will be combined very much in the future with professional medical care, where one is the entry because the patients go on the internet first before they see us, um, and they combine a structured history taking, image analysis, artificial intelligence, and also gathering this information together and combining, combining it with telecare or present care. And I think this integrated digital health will be very, very much present in the, in the next five years. Um, the whole telemedicine and digital change will be essential for global health and for crisis response. Um, we still currently have at the moment 2 billion people who do not have access to care by doctors. And under the crisis that we see at the moment in various countries around the world, sometimes we're not able to scale our care quick enough. And digital is not the only solution, but is part of the solution to really address the, the, the global health crisis that's been ongoing for decades, but also the current crisis that's been ongoing for a year and a half. And in 2019, the World Health Organization realized that, and they really wrote their first global strategy on digital health in the last year. It is vastly expanding and it is an interesting resource I think for, for our work or also for, for organizations where, where we're moving on a worldwide level. And for me, very, very much at, my, at the center of my heart is basically, we have to educate the healthcare workforce for the digital for future. And that's an absolute priority. Change will not be introduced into our daily patient care just by introducing technology, but very much by being able to rethink medicine, to change our care in our clinics, in our, in our practices, and to really rethink medicine uh, from the ground up. And I think the comb combination of our human skills, of our interaction skills, of our intuition and our um, our knowledge that's been built up by years or decades of experience as doctor, this will be combined um, by small fragments of um, information which come through apps, which comes through clinical decision support system based on large data files or an image analysis. And the same as we basically go through the day nowadays and we refer to our smartphones for information and for decisions, um, how we travel, where we go, and what information we need, this will be more and more introduced into our daily clinical practice. And this is not trivial. And this um, basically digital experience from the private side does not translate necessarily to, um, to competency as being doctors. So for me, the last five years, I was very much involved in uh, rethinking medical school and introducing the first digital um, health curriculum in Germany at the medical school, but also working with the doctors association to do continuous medical education to go into the residency programs 
and for one at like a basic level as a, a qualification for all, but also more detailed um, topics and also leadership programs to really build the next generation of doctors that are that are able to to drive the transformation forward. So I would like to conclude. What's the future of medicine? I think the future of medicine, um, symbolized by Da Vinci's um, human, will be. I think most of all, the classical core principles of medicine that, um, that are core to our profession for, for hundreds of years. I think the doctor-patient relationship, the, the trust between doctor and patient, which is paramount, the basic skills of seeing, hearing, using our senses, this will be unchanged and this will be still the core of our profession. But at the same time, we have to use technologies. And like we learned that we can um, hear better with the stethoscope or we can see better with the microscope or we can um, do surgery with a scalpel, um, we need to use those skills as well as the more and more connected care, the data-rich medicines, application, and clinical decision systems. Only, I think, if we train our left and right arm and we use it purposefully on a daily basis, we can really deliver for our patient the best care possible. Thank you very much. That was a great final slide. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. That was very, very informative. Um, Jarika, would you also please switch on your camera now? Um, Thank you. We have time for some discussion. Please, for those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A uh, uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, le let me start. Um, Erika, when, when I was president of the German Society for Internal Medicine, we had a reception in Berlin and there was a representative of, the, of your embassy there. And she was talking about the development of digital medicine in your country. And I learned there that your country is kind of a role model for developing uh, digital medicine. Can you tell us what your country is doing better than other countries? Uh, well, that question uh, uh, might also go to my colleague speaking in the next session from the Ministry of Social Affairs. Uh, but uh, what we've done, we have a, a pretty good electronic health records uh, system that's available to all healthcare professionals and the information from different healthcare providers moves smoothly, quite smoothly. And, uh, and we are uh, constantly uh, thinking about new ways. But in terms of telemedicine, uh, what is a barrier that we, or, or a mountain we still need to conquer is how uh, different, for example, remote monitoring uh, uh, solutions, smaller solutions. We have very many central solutions that are working very well, but how can we uh, integrate uh, new uh, solutions into the wor already working uh, healthcare uh, or electronic health record system and how to standardize this information and make it um, comfortable for healthcare professionals and patients to use? These are our uh, upcoming uh, uh, challenges. Okay, Sebastian, I have also one question for you. You showed us in your presentation that companies are collecting a lot of medical information about us without even knowing us what's happening. So this is something that's ongoing in the background. And, uh, and in addition to that, as we know, some of these uh, giants from California have started uh, digital medicine companies. That's not, I mean, I would say you don't have to be too happy about that as a human being. So, <clears throat> How can, do you have any idea or are there any ideas around how this, this problem can be handled? Yeah, I think it, this, is, this will be, I think, a prime challenge, I think, for the next decade. And, and it will be very difficult to control because what we've learned so far is um, that not only those companies are technically able to do that, they are also willing to do it no matter what the legal aspects are. And, and, and a very good example was, um, at, in 2019, when Google um, basically um, mishandled data, which was stored on a separate server from an insurance company and they accessed uh, the medical files of 55 million um, insured Americans, the full uh, doctor reports, lab results, pathology results 
all that information and combined it with the generic Google data that they have through our email accounts or through our search profiles. And um, this will this is something that's ongoing and we have probably, I think, lost a lot of time in the last uh, decade to really regulate that. I think within Europe, we do have, um, we do have um, at least, I think a little bit of a different understanding from the American more commercially driven and the Chinese very much um, state um, controlled aspect to data and, and the use of data. And um, currently uh, there is an ongoing a regulation to basically regulate the tech companies, but at the same time also to enable um, healthcare professionals, and especially, especially the academic side of medicine, to use health data in, in large quantities, because we, we also need to do that in a, in a safe and structured way. And the formation of the European health data space um, is one of the, one of the um, projects that's been drawing forward. And also we have various projects at national levels. I think we have to be able to also offer good digital uh, therapies and to uh, good digital solutions. Um, but it will be an uphill battle because we are lacking currently years behind um, in comparison to the big tech companies. Okay. Yarika, one question to you from the chat. Uh, I read this question to you. Telemedicine implementation needs a big investment, educated population, better internet platforms. How could development, undeveloped or let's say developing countries uh, start to implement telemedicine in a way that they can afford? That's a very tricky and difficult question. How would you answer that? Uh, I would answer that here are two possibilities how this uh, would play out. Uh, first is, uh, I don't know which, uh, from which to start. Basically, the first is uh, that we in uh, more developed countries uh, uh, do the investments of developing and then we will have uh, sorted out what works and what doesn't and then uh, it, it, it makes at least the development process or the uh, picking uh, solutions that work uh, cheaper for developing countries. But uh, the other option is a total opposite, which means that they in um, less developed countries they have uh, less regulations, less re restrictions uh, for trying out new models. And as uh, uh, Sebastian very nicely described, uh, we in healthcare sector are a little bit lacking behind uh, the technology development. And uh, the technology, the smartphones are everywhere. And it might be that the developing countries will be testing out uh, new ways of delivering care before uh, we will get there uh, with our regulations, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay, thank you. That's, these are good answers. There is a question that I would like to answer it because I'm a pulmonologist and it's a, it's a question regarding lung diseases. Why inhalers are not connected to help with patient compliance? This is starting right now. There are now uh, inhalers upcoming that are called smart inhalers that are connected uh, to the smartphones. Uh, and there are even uh, very advanced models that are not only connected to smartphones that then will allow, allow not only to control compliance, but also to show if patients do the right maneuvers and things like that. The final question goes to Sebastian and it's also from the chat. It says here, is the problem of interoperability still a problem? that sort of stands in the way of implementing these programs? Um, yes, I think there's still a huge problem of interoperability. And for, for basically decades, um, for, for tech or software companies, it was basically the business model to really make sure that the programs are not interoperable. You want to basically lock people into the system and make it very difficult for them to switch to, to new systems. So what we have in medicine, we, we still have a lot of the legacy software um, that is basically developed from, from 30 years ago. And it's very hard to switch to new platforms. Um, I think what are kind of like good aspects or a little bit of... Um, light at the end of the horizon is that legislation uh, changed now 
to really make interoperability a core requirement for, for software products at the moment. So anything that is not interoperable will not be allowed to go into, into practice, especially at, in the M health space. And um, it became a core requirement at the end of 2019. And I think that's a good development, um, but it will still be years until kind of like the full integration will work and, and it, will be, it will be very, very um, long probably process of change until then. Erika, a question in that, in that context also from the chat to you, it goes in the same direction. Um, all new products, not, not all new products to provide application programming interfaces to be used by other software. I mean, that's an issue when you want to sort of have a national nationwide system ongoing. How do you deal with that in your country? Uh, I must say that this is uh, the biggest issue, the uh, interoperability question. And uh, we are right now trying to tackle it with that same um, pilot project, uh, new pilot projects, uh, what I was uh, referring to in my um, presentation. Uh, we're trying with uh, some solutions uh, to work out the, uh, the way that uh, our central uh, system would connect with different vendors uh, solutions and how different vendor solutions would look the same to the doctors so that there would be some kind of uh, uptake uh, that we would not be just uh, uh, developing one solution uh, and uh, then have no idea how to integrate that into actual working uh, uh, conditions uh, of the doctors. So uh, I think it's a very good question. There is no simple answer and we are all trying to figure it out. Yeah, there is the question if there if we can expect something by the European community in this regard. I'm not sure about that. I know that in Germany, Sebastian, there was a, 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 what we call Sachverständigenrat. They were they published a paper. They are sort of a, a, a an organization that makes recommendations to the government that suggested some rules and regulations. But does any one of you know if there are solutions ongoing on the European level? There's at the moment there's a lot of ongoing legislation in the European um, at the EU level, and um, I'm one of the representative for the for the standing committee of European doctors, and I uh, I chair the area of digital competencies for doctors and and also the the M Health and telemedicine and AI group part of that. Um, at the moment there's like probably in most European countries, a lot of ongoing legislation and, and strategy process that usually are initiated at the European level and then very quickly in parallel picked up in the in the member countries. So it's um, it's actually really a challenge. Even even if you have a focus and you're interested in it, it's very difficult to um, to, to stay on focus. And I know. Um, that um, IFIM is also um, is very much interested, I think, in policy making and addressing that. And I think with CPME, I think we have a at least a good structure to monitor what's actually ongoing at the moment. And um, I, I can I can share the, the the link to the to the website with the ongoing areas, as in interoperability, telemedicine. Um, mobile health, uh, but also the European health data space. And this is, I think, a good way to get involved in the discussion or to, to maybe exchange ideas between different um, medical association and, and um, at the European level, but then also at the national level. Thank you. Uh, Jerika, the last question goes to you, also from the chat. What do you think about the role of caregivers in medicine in the dynamics of e-health that you showed us. There is a lot of dynamics and going, a lot of changes will be implemented in the foreseeable future. Will there be some kind of a change in our job descriptions in the future? I mean, and or will there be new professions in the medical field that sort of come out of these changes? What, what do you expect? Uh, I think it's inevitable that we will have new roles in medicine, uh, new professions uh, in medicine. Uh, and uh, as I said, there will be a workforce, there's a workforce uh, shortage right now, and it won't, uh, it doesn't seem right now that it'll just go away. 
there will definitely be need for uh, uh, other professionals in healthcare, and also the roles in healthcare might be uh, might need to be uh, uh, looked over so that every professional does uh, what uh, he is supposed to and uh, try to get everything uh, out uh, of the way that can be done uh, by others. So that is definitely inevitable and uh, all telemedicine solutions will uh, help to uh, contribute here. They might support this change, but the change is gonna, uh, the change is going on right now uh, in different countries uh, on different speed. That's a very nice final word. Thanks to both of you for your full presentations and the great discussion. Uh, I must say I learned a lot today. Um, Thanks to you, thanks to the audience, and I would like to hand over to the chairman of the next part of the of, of the symposium. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, and welcome uh, to this job topic. Uh, now we will continue with uh, innovation and artificial science. My name is Katti Gerberg and I am PhD student, uh, student and internist uh, from Tartu University Hospital and also a member of the Estonian Society of Internal Medicine. So uh, there has been a lot of discourse over the past few years as um, the rise of uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare and how predictive analytics uh, can be can help uh, improve uh, diagnostic accuracy, minimize risk and improve clinical effic efficiency. But this, uh, despite the benefits, many healthcare professionals are still worried about uh, worry of the implication of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so we uh, have to remember that it's uh, not a replacement of qualified professional. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if our aging population continues uh, to grow at the same rate as it uh, has been growing, without uh, major structural and uh, transformational changes, uh, healthcare system still uh, will struggle to remain uh, sustainable. Now I have to make a, a confession, what I really don't like to admit, but uh, I have been troubled to understand what is the, what in uh, artificial science. Uh, so at this point, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, who is Aurora Ursula Joala. She has medical degree from uh, Tartu University while working on public uh, health matters uh, in different uh, non-governmental organizations. She has experience, uh, experience in uh, policy making and national on a national and international level. She ha is also the e-service innovation and tele tele development advisor in the Ministry of Estonia. Uh, she is uh, focused uh, on internal uh, partnerships and e-service collaboration on the European level. So now floor is your, yours, Aurora. Thank you. Uh, so I'll share my screen. So uh, hi everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, also Dr. Gerberg, uh, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, as said, I'm here to kick off the next uh, session that we are going to have here today. And uh, in opposed to the next two speakers, my uh, uh, experience is not so much hands-on with implementing AI in the healthcare field, but to 
make sure that the preconditions are met for innovation, including AI. And uh, I have also worked as a doctor uh, in the ER, but uh, as Dr. Kerberg said, not anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in uh, not more than a generation, we have a transition from a world in which infectious diseases were the greatest health uh, challenge to one in which multiple chronic illnesses and disability are the biggest problem. Uh, a pretty strange fact in uh, in the pandemic times, but still. And the implications uh, for our health systems are massive, but not only are we alarmingly ill-equipped to cope, we are facing a frightening lack of evidence on how they need to be adapted. If we don't address this uh, evidence gap and quickly, we cannot uh, hope to create health systems capable of delivering the comprehensive uh, care to the patients. Uh, that's so desperate, desperately needed. So uh, the main pillars uh, of the 21st century healthcare are sustainability, uh, quality, and human-centeredness. As a society ages, the number of uh, working age people will decrease, while health costs uh, will increase according to the current projections. It means a growing gap between available resources and uh, needs in healthcare. On the left, uh, the solid border colors represent the current situation, and uh, the so, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the solid colors uh, uh, represent the uh, situation in 2080, and uh, the borders represent the situation now. And also on the right side, you can see uh, a little um, analysis uh, done uh, by Praxis, uh, that is a socio-economic research center here in Estonia, uh, that has uh, analyzed the future and uh, the sustainability of Estonian healthcare system in three different scenarios. Uh, in population aging, uh, in increasing use in common organs uh, were, co uh, were considered and mapped and different so between revenue and expenditure in 2030 as percentage of uh, GDP is presented. So uh, the future is looking a little bit grim. In terms of quality indicators, Estonia is above average compared to the uh, uh, Europe, uh, taking into account, for example, patients' rights and uh, access uh, to healthcare. At the same time, if you look closely at uh, some of the health in indicators, outpatient uh, mortality, for example, we are uh, quite behind with our Pal Baltic uh, colleagues. At the same time, low quality is a global problem. It is estimated that uh, almost every person experiences uh, some diagnostic error in their lifetime. While drugs that are in daily use work uh, well for every fourth, if not every 24th person, a study in the UK found that, that more than half of healthcare procedures performed were of vague evidence. And if you look at the whole uh, process as a whole, more and more people want to move out from the red box uh, to the green box. Uh, so uh, spend less time in hospitals and at, at risk of infection and more uh, time at home in good health. And in the light of the three key issues, it is clear that we need new models in healthcare. Where reactive and uh, inefficient hospital based healthcare is being replaced by proactive people centered healthcare. Inevitably, uh, however, uh, we need to ask uh, how to deliver such innovation in a way that keeps healthcare costs within reason. I think a really nice uh, introduction to the topic was already done by pre previous speakers. And uh, fortunately, innovation in healthcare is not necessarily a cost item. Uh, McKinsey estimates that more people-centered and uh, innovative uh, healthcare can actually save uh, up, up to $240 per person per year, while life expectancy will increase uh, by up to two years. Uh, financially, in uh, the Estonian context, uh, this will mean uh, savings of uh, up to 1% of the GDP per year. However, uh, 
such an innovation requires a, a much more extensive data analysis than before. Uh, virtually all of the activities listed above, remote monitoring, precision treatment, uh, risk assessment, etc., are data-driven solutions that require data-driven collaboration. So let's look at a few examples. So, uh, Clalit, which operates in Israel and is responsible for more than 50% of the health of this population, is a model of data-driven health to its enormous data analysis capabilities. For example, based on their electronic uh, health data, they have cre created an algorithm uh, that, predict, uh, that predicts uh, the intensity uh, uh, with uh, which a patient should be treated for uh, high blood pressure, for example. And a lot of different uh, solutions like this are also available. And uh, uh, as an Estonian, I can also look a little bit closer uh, to home. For example, Estonian company TermTest is training an algorithm that can detect suspicious birthmarks using uh, birthmark uh, images from various uh, Estonian uh, hospitals. And uh, this is exactly what the world's largest companies are doing to res uh, reduce diagnostic errors, also mentioned before, only uh, on significantly larger amounts of data. And since uh, we have, uh, are touching the AI a little bit, then let's make sure that we are on the same page. So uh, what is AI? AI is the development of computer systems that are capable of performing tasks that normally require human intelligence, just such as decision making, object uh, detection, uh, solving uh, complex problems, etc. So AI and uh, related technologies are increasingly prevalent in business and society and are beginning to be applied in healthcare. These technologies have uh, the potential to transform many aspects of patient care, uh, let's say from administrative uh, processes to data-driven clinical decision support that, that is based on machine learning. The healthcare industry continues to evolve as um, machine learning and AI in technology become more prevalent. And in today's short Time. I'm not going to focus on bettering the administrative purposes per se, but uh, this could be an interesting topic for another time. So uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, AI is not one technology, but rather uh, than a collection of them. And most of these technologies have immediate relevance in the healthcare field. But uh, specific processes and tasks they support very widely. On this slide, uh, some of uh, some particular AI uh, technologies uh, of high importance to the healthcare sector uh, have list have been listed. That uh, I'm going to touch on briefly. So uh, first of all, uh, machine learning. Uh, it is a statistical technique uh, for fitting models to data and to learn by training models with data. It is one of the most common forms of AI and it is a broad technique at the core of many different approaches uh, to AI. And in healthcare, the most common uh, application of this of uh, traditional machine uh, learning is in precision medicine, uh, where um, Protocols are likely to succeed on a patient based on various patient uh, attributes and uh, treatment uh, contexts. And uh, the great majority of machine learning and uh, precision medicine applications require a training dataset for which the outcomes, uh, outcome variable, so for example, onset of the disease is known. And this is called a supervised uh, learning. So um, moving on, uh, natural language uh, process, uh, pr processing. 
Uh, making sense of the human language has been a goal of AI researchers since uh, 1950s. Uh, this field uh, includes applications such as speech recognition, text analysis, translations and other goals related to language. Uh, in healthcare, the dominant applications of uh, natural language processing involve the creation and uh, the understanding and also the uh, classification of different clinical documents and uh, published research. Uh, then we have different uh, rule-based expert systems, so that uh, the systems that are based on if-then rules that were dominant in the technology of AI when it was first introduced and are still quite uh, commonly uh, used in healthcare uh, widely for the different clinical uh, decision support uh, system purposes. Uh, then we have physical robots uh, introduced in 2000 in the US and uh, that are um, there to provide um, so-called superpowers uh, to surgeons, improving their ability to see or create precise and minimally invasive uh, incisions and so on and so on. And last but not least, the uh, different robotic process automation, uh, but uh, this has nothing to do with uh, robots, robots per se, but uh, the technology performs structured digital tasks for administrative purposes. So based on different uh, business rules and so on. So uh, as I said, AI can improve various different spheres of healthcare. Uh, I must warn you that this is uh, definitely not a complete list of uh, possible Im implementations of AI in healthcare, but uh, rather uh, to give an overview from the uh, patient care perspective. And uh, in addition to these uh, use cases in the treatment process, uh, we cannot overlook uh, the use of AI in biomedical research, uh, where AI can help with a variety of different tasks. Uh, for, uh, for example, literature mining uh, and uh, AI can be used in a automated uh, data collection and also automated experience. And uh, there are a lot of more different applications of the AI, but uh, due to the sh short time span, we cannot cover this today. But uh, still, let's look at some examples. So as you know, uh, the histopathological diagnosis made by pathologists is based on uh, how many different uh, morphological changes or pathologic features have uh, been found in the examined sample by visual uh, identification. However, uh, even with the systematic training and standard guidelines, uh, such an assessment is uh, subjective in nature. In addition, uh, non-invasive uh, non and uh, minimally invasive tissue sampling has significantly reduced uh, the amount and quality of tissue material available for uh, a patholo pathological examinations. But at the same time, uh, the, the, there is a growing demand for, for high precision diagnostics that can provide uh, predictive or prognostic recommendations. So in digital pathology, artificial intelligence has been used uh, for both lighter, for example, uh, uh, detection purposes and also for more complex. Uh, so for example, uh, diagnosing a disease or predicting the outcome of the treatment. So two different purposes. And uh, many applications of AI in digital pathology have been developed to perform time consuming tasks to enable pathologists to perform uh, more important tasks uh, such as decision making. Mm. Uh, though it was mentioned that in Estonia, the overall, uh, uh, overall uh, quality and the progression in the world of digital health has been uh, uh, 
pre pretty good in the past 20 years, but uh, we are still uh, lacking in the AI department. Uh, in Estonia, the birth of digital pathology was uh, in 2019, when uh, the first scanner related to tissue examination, uh, so for the histopathological slides, was introduced for daily work at uh, the East Tallinn Central Hospital. And uh, despite previous hesitations, the scanner is now being used uh, uh, daily by pathologists and can sc uh, scan up to 500 slides per day. And uh, the greatest uh, advantage of digital pathology technology became very clear during the COVID pandemic uh, and helped us lots uh, to ensure the healthcare processes in these tiring times. And so the slide scanners are uh, the list they used to for also different uh, research projects, uh, as well as uh, the medical curriculum in the pre uh, preclinical years. And uh, given uh, this impressive uh, array of uh, different applications, it is perhaps surprising uh, that in the real world, uh, the developments of machine learning uh, algorithms in clinical practice are pretty rare. And the potential in, uh, of AI in healthcare has not been uh, real, uh, realized uh, up to date. And uh, different, uh, and I have, uh, gathered here a few different uh, reasons why that uh, might be. So let's go over this uh, real quick. So first of all, data quality. Uh, the, the performance of any AI-based approach is primarily dependent on both the quality and the quantity of the input data. And uh, the data used to train an AI algorithm need to be clean, uh, curated with the ma maximal signal to noise ratio and as accurate and comprehensive as possible in order to achieve the maximum predictive performance. Secondly, uh, the data accessibility, accessibility and regulatory roadblocks. Uh, this was also uh, covered a bit in the telemedicine uh, session, so that the issues uh, remain pretty similar. Um, privacy is especially in healthcare is uh, especially vigorously enforced when it uh, comes to me medical data. And since patient data in uh, European countries is not typically uh, allowed to, to leave Europe, Many hospitals and research institutions are wary of different uh, cloud platforms and prefer to use their own servers. And for the startup companies, it is uh, difficult to get their hands on uh, this uh, data. Uh, luckily, it is a little bit better for medical researchers. researchers. Uh, in Estonia, we are trying to uh, 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 tackle this problem by, uh, by hopefully launching a governmental initiative called uh, Digital Innovation, Innovation Estonia, or in short, DigiNest, that uh, could offer uh, for the R&D, uh, could offer scientific uh, data for R&D developments and uh, for the different healthcare projects, but uh, this is still underway. So, uh, also interpretability, uh, despite uh, their high accuracy and ease of applications, uh, criticism regarding the lack of inter interpretability and uh, contrasting uh, domain inspired in, in intuitiveness uh, found in handcrafted networks is a possible obstacle uh, towards the clinical uh, adaptation. Uh, we don't have any clear reimbursements and clinical adaptation uh, guides in in place and last but, but not least the integration of ai into workflows uh, even with the highly effective uh, algorithms uh, that overcome all of the above challenges human barriers to adoption are substantial mm, in order to ensure that this technology can reach and benefit patients uh, we uh, will 
it is important to maintain a focus on clinical ability and patient outcomes and to advance uh, methods uh, and uh, to achieve a better understanding of human and com computer interactions because doctors make decisions based on learned knowledge uh, uh, previous um, previous uh, experience and intuition and problem solving skills so we also need to create trusts uh, into the AI as well. So that was a really short introduction from my side. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> thank you for sh uh, sharing uh, your knowledge. It was interesting, uh, high spiraling uh, presentation. Uh, I will remind that question will be uh, at the end of the, uh, this topic and all question may be uh, written to the chat in the bottom of the screen. And now we move to the next speaker. Uh, excuse you, I, I, because it's a little late, uh, I think it's better that the question we will postpone at the end of the other uh, session. Otherwise, I will, I will and I, I, I think it's very important to stay in the time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. It will be too long. It's, it's already very long the, the, the webinar. So uh, if the speaker can stay in the in the in the time, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So next uh, speaker will be um, Michal Forsak, who shares his uh, experience in Europe and uh, in the world. She has medical degree and also PhD degree in internal medicine. So could you please? Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for invitation. Uh, uh, I uh, will talk about uh, innovation in uh, telemedicine and uh, attempts uh, to use artificial intelligence uh, in uh, daily clinical practice. Uh, I prepared uh, my lecture based uh, on my own experience uh, related uh, to the development of uh, telemedicine uh, services in Poland and uh, based on uh, European and world uh, publications. Okay, let's see what works. Okay, 21st century is uh, the time of technological revolution. So um, we are surrounded by new technologies, uh, starting from, uh, for example, mobile banking or contactless payments and uh, ending with uh, uh, the development of numerous mobile applications to monitor health state. Uh, currently in uh, online, shop, online uh, shops, we may, uh, they are available about several thousands uh, applications for health monitoring. So whenever we like it or not, uh, we must adapt to these new technological tools. Uh, it is quite common, uh, it's more and more common that uh, patients uh, may come to us with uh, uh, clinical data, uh, for example, blood pressure measurements collected, by, uh, collected with the use of mobile applications. Mm. We exactly know that, uh, based on the literature that, and also based on our experience, that uh, uh, this process uh, results in better treatment outcomes and mobile applications help, uh, helps us uh, with uh, patient compliance. The telemedicine, there would be no telemedicine without uh, close cooperation of specialists uh, in three fields. Uh, it's, uh, of course, it's medicine, uh, there are law specialists and information technology uh, special specialists. So only good uh, cooperation within these areas guarantees success and, uh, first of all, enables us safe performance of uh, services. COVID-19 outbreak uh, has changed a lot. And uh, since uh, that moment, uh, telemedicine, so far a new field of medicine has gained uh, impetus. Uh, on 11th March, 2012, uh, the World uh, Health Organization declared a pandemic uh, of an infection disease, COVID-19, and uh, it has accelerated uh, the use of telemedicine 
on an unprecedented scale in our in European countries and all over the world. There are many areas of telemedicine. A previous speakers talk about that. Uh, it, they are not only consultations, but they are teleprocedures, teleprocedures telecare, e conferences, telemonitoring, e registration, uh, telerehabilitation, emergency medical services. This is also associated with telemedicine, teleteaching, ecosystem. But I would like to concentrate at the moment on e consultations. Uh, and about, I would like to talk about modern platforms of telemedicine. Many European platforms enable um, providing services with the use of free. Uh, communication channels. So it's audio, video, and chat. Um, we started telemedicine years ago, and first it was audio, then video, and uh, now chat is uh, quite popular, but uh, we are worried about that. Chat is the best um, form of contact with the doctor for patients, but it's the most challenging and the most difficult form of contact for doctors to contact with the patient. This is, in my opinion, is the most difficult uh, form uh, to contact with the patients. Um, then transfer uh, on all modern platforms enable us to transfer patients lab tests, for example, or discharge letters via application before uh, we start telemedical consultation. It is worth doing and it is a go good tool uh, based on our experience. E-consultation is uh, a fully complete consultation. Of course, there is a lack of physical examination till today, but after telemedical consultation, we may perform a diagnosis in many cases, but we may also issue e-prescription E-sick leave, uh, e-referral, uh, we may give medical instructions and, uh, for example, uh, we may perform interpretation of uh, many test results. Uh, this, there are some examples from my country. On the right part of the presentation, uh, you can see e-prescription. So what we can do after consultation, we may give, uh, when, we, when, we, when, we order, when we issue E prescription patient receive a four digital code number and with this code patient may go to the pharmacy and may take drugs uh, may buy drugs the same process uh, is uh, uh, with uh, is present with uh, e referral so if a physician need a consultation patient as well receive four digital code number so we do not need to, to do any paperwork uh, nowadays and another example, this is the electronic sick leave. So after telemedical consultation, especially if we have a patient with infection disease, such as common cold or uh, urinary tract infections, we may, after telemedical consultation, we may give electronic, uh, electronic uh, sick leave. Patient exactly know how many, the, the number of days of absence, and this data is sent directly to the patient company, where patient, where our patient work, for example. And all issued documents, such as e-prescriptions, e-referrals, e 6 leaves, are uh, available on the patient online account. This is quite new platform. We still work on this platform because our idea is to put all medical data in one platform. Nowadays, we may observe that sometimes patient uh, is treated in the public sector uh, by, for, for example, by dermatologists, uh, by cardiologists in the public sector, in other hospital by uh, gastroenterologists, for example. But we we need to, uh, in our opinion, our all doctors should have. Uh, should, should have possibility to know all patient medical history. And as you know, patients not, uh, sometimes uh, don't tell us about all chronic disease, uh, drug allergies, and etc. Right, when it uh, comes to legal issues in Poland, <coughs> some uh, legal acts uh, required amendments. Uh, uh, for example, it was uh, the act of uh, the information system in healthcare in Poland uh, or the act uh, on medical activity. Thanks to that uh, process, we, we may, uh, we may uh, perform telemedical consultations in Poland. Uh, some areas requiring additional regulations or the amendment of normative acts, uh, for example, it's the Code of Medical Ethics, uh, the Act of Professional of Doctors and Dentists, uh, but in Europe we 
should uh, definitely uh, work on uh, one uh, standard of, for telemedicine consultation. This standard, these recommendations should be introduced. Uh, uh, we should uh, discuss about, uh, about standards uh, of uh, all low standards of, uh, of uh, telemedical equipments uh, as well. And uh, let's talk about future prospects. Uh, uh, as you notice, uh, uh, till today, there is a lack of, uh, generally, there is a lack of physical examination. So extending the scope of e-consultation to include a physical examination with the use of telemedical equipment. Professor Kuhn shown us a few examples uh, I have uh, here as well. So um, till today, the use of telemedical equipment is in the testing phase, uh, but we know that we may use ECG. Uh, we have uh, good results uh, in dermatology with dermatoscopy. Uh, for example, we may uh, we have good imaging with throat examination, and here there is a, also example of a stethoscope. Uh, we still work on it uh, because uh, thanks uh, to use the various tools of uh, uh, technology, uh, we may uh, we may uh, help more patients, and more patients will not need stationary visit. Uh, other future prospects, uh, it's of course artificial intelligence algorithms, but it's supporting the physicians, the phys the physicians with this tool. Um, artificial intelligence, they are ongoing attempts uh, to use artificial intelligence in Europe. Uh, uh, based on our experience, uh, we know that this tool may be helpful as long uh, as it is used by physicians. Uh, for example, for a differential diagnosis, uh, uh, this gives definitely support for the physician, but as for now, it cannot replace the physician in making a diagnosis and uh, treating the patient. Um, as, you, uh, as you see, telemedicine is a new form of contact with patients. This is new tool for us. So training of uh, physicians, conducting e-visits, e-consultations is urgently urgently needed. Uh, so that's the reason why we, uh, pro we, prop we should propagate and we should discuss about e-consultation scam. Uh, very often doctors don't know uh, what to, uh, how to perform history, te telemedical history taking properly. Uh, we should uh, give uh, a recommendation and instruction what we should tell our patients if uh, our patient uh, uh, do not observe uh, any signs of improvement, for example. And this is uh, another example of uh, telemedical history. Uh, we, uh, we recommend our doctors to ask about not only shift compliance, but also associated symptoms, chronic diseases, allergies. Uh, uh, and it is very important, especially if we do not have face-to-face -face contact with our patient, because uh, during telemedical consultation, it's easier to overlook important symptoms. Uh, and here there is a list of uh, uh, red flag symptoms. Sometimes I observe that patient uh, may call uh, to us with chest pain or severe abdominal pain. And so if, if it is emergency situation, it is definitely not a good idea for telemedical consultation. And uh, this patient should be referred to uh, ER unit or to face-to-face -face visit immediately. So we should, uh, we should uh, uh, inform our doctors and uh, secure our doctors. So we should be more vigilant uh, when we talk about uh, these symptoms. And another important issue is EC cliff. Uh, we have experience in it and we know uh, that issuing C cliffs after chat consultation is uh, not recommended. And in Poland, we do not uh, recommend this solution because uh, patients may easily chat cheat us with that and it's uh, uh, very difficult to perform proper history taking. Uh, caution is uh, recommended uh, in uh, we know uh, regarding prolongation of cyclics after previous visits uh, and also uh, when uh, regarding backdated cyclics. Uh, when we uh, think about backdated cyclics, we should always consider traditional face-to-face -face, 
consultation, not, telemedical, not telemedicine. And uh, the last issue is ordering examination. Um, we know that not every examination may be ordered after remote consultation uh, without physical examination. So it's not a problem with lab tests, for example, if I want to check the creatinine level or sugar, uh, sugar uh, glucose or something like that, it's easy. But if I have a patient with abdominal pain and when I consider CT scan, physical examination is uh, needed. So as you see, there are many advantages and disadvantages of uh, telemedicine. Uh, we know that uh, telemedicine is associated with easier access to medical care, especially for patients who, who, who are in small towns and villages. Uh, we may support smaller medical centers uh, uh, with regard to specialist services and consultations. Telemedicine gives a good opportunity to get emergency advice during telemedical duty and during COVID-19 pandemic, it helped us a lot because patients contacted with us uh, uh, in uh, uh, with with, uh, uh, with uh, not uh, with some kind of infection problems as well. Uh, based on uh, many publications, we know that uh, telemedicine is associated with lower number, using of telemedicine is associated with lower number of hospitalizations and shorter hospital stay. Uh, we know that uh, uh, it is proven in patients with chronic disease, uh, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, heart failure, diabetes, uh, um, it is also, we may save the time after, thanks to telemedicine, shorter duration of a visit in comparison with stationary visit. Uh, it's also lower financial costs, but not only for the institutions, uh, but also for the patients. Uh, and one important thing, uh, telemedicine gives uh, possibility to consult physicians from other parts of the country and also uh, is associated with activation of uh, disabled Physicians. This is good, uh, good information for elderly doctors as well who want to stay at home and still want to be active. So we, 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 we may use uh, uh, their experience uh, and they may uh, continue consultation. And what about these advantages? Uh, first, it is no direct contact, uh, danger to overlook health and life-threatening symptoms. Uh, I first uh, earlier I mentioned about the chat as the most difficult form of telemedical examination. Uh, we noticed uh, some technical problems for, for many doctors. Integration with many platforms uh, is quite complicated, so we should closely cooperate with IT specialists to, to uh, resolve these problems and some way elderly patients required uh, uh, edu more education because knowledge is important uh, knowledge of how to operate medical applications and pro telemedicine programs is important to, uh, to, 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 to to perform this form of uh, consultation and just uh, uh, to sum up just take home few take home messages uh, so telemedicine is a new form of contact with the patients uh, Therefore, training physicians uh, on the principles of conducting teleconsultation should be, uh, uh, should be considered. Uh, telemedical consultation cannot uh, replace stationary visits, but uh, now we know that uh, telemedical consultation increases uh, patient safety, and it was proven during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and uh, based on our experience, the best suggestion is a long-term hybrid care model, stationary visit, alternately with a telemedical visit. I work at the Institute of Transplantology, and we 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 uh, uh, we, we we use this model. So, for example, today I have a patient we're on a face-to-face -face consultation, and uh, three months later, I uh, this this patient has a follow-up visit by phone, for example, or by. Uh, by video, it is a video consultation, so it's not necessary to come uh, for the patient to come to the outpatient clinic and uh, perform face-to-face -face consultation. So, and this is much safer uh, solution for our patients. Telemedical consultation may well be used in patients during remission periods of chronic disease. Uh, it's generally safely. Um, I would like to point uh, some uh, limitation of visits. Uh, it's not only lack of physical examination during the consultation, but uh, 
uh, I would like to point out also psychological issues and the necessity to know the operation of software and mobile applications. Uh, uh, we should draw the attention to the necessity of optimizing the software of use for telemedicine consultation. And it is important to adapt the law throughout the Europe to safe performance of telemedicine services. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience. But now we uh, move to the uh, last but not least speaker on this topic. Uh, Mikael Salid Sriado uh, will introduce us um, and add his uh, view to the future prospect of innovation and artificial uh, intelligence. He is a member of uh, Spanish uh, Society uh, uh, of Internal Medicine. He collaborates uh, in several research groups uh, which dealing with uh, digital competence and innovation in electronic health records. We are ready to listen to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you can see the screen now. Uh, well, my name is Ismael Said Criado. I work yeah. in Vigo in the emergency department of Hospital Alvaro Conqueiro. And um, I'm talking here about the future perspectives of artificial intelligence in internal medicine. My first uh, question I would like to answer is if uh, internists are prepared to apply digital tools on, based on artifi artificial intelligence in the clinical settings. From my point of view, doctors are always ready for innovation and progress. In the coming years, it will be necessary to develop digital skills that help doctors use new technologies for the benefit of their patients. Uh, electronic health records has, has developed rapidly in the last uh, 30 years, going from manuscripts paper to typewritten texts and later dig digitalization in PDF format. The next steps will be to digitize the clinical context of these reports into structured and well, well cut information so that they can fulfill complex decision making systems uh, predictly, uh, predictive and predictably powered by artificial intelligence. For example, voice recognition tools uh, will become increasingly sophisticated, coming to dream of an interface that listens to the spoken conversation between doctors and patients and converts the audio into well-encoded information. Natural language processing technology is increasing today to extract the data and clinical information to develop uh, big data analysis. Um, doctors must acquire skills to improve the quality of clinical data incorporated into, into digital information systems which provides the necessary data to nourish complex decision algorithms. Not so much to, repl to replace our work, but to enhance it thanks to the clinical decision support tools. It's necessary to know concepts, concepts such as uh, semantic interoperability, which implies that the information is, the in is incorporated in the, into the information systems at any point in patient care and can be consequently used by other health professionals. Stop entering information redundantly. Well-coordinated information system could ensure that clinical data is only entered the first time and then reused. Where to start, where to start the, digitize, the, 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 the digitization process? In the first place, the healthcare processes should be rebuilt taking advantage of new technologies of information and communications. This process should focus on high value medicine, eliminating irrelevant information and redundant uh, procedures. That's why doctors must train in digital health, acquiring digital skills of interaction with clinical information systems powered by artificial intelligence. Once we have well-structured uh, clinical data in the information systems, the interaction with other patient data, such as their genetic map, their lifestyles, habits, or socioeconomical aspects may lead to a more personalized medicine, also called prediction medicine. Uh, 
management of this massive data will be powered by artificial intelligence, opening a new horizon in the way we care for our pa patients. Clinical decision support tools will be essential to improve the quality of care and patient safety in the face of possible genetically based side effects of drugs, for example. Other highly probable application of artificial intelligence in the very near future will be virtual assistance for synthesizing uh, the scientific literature, which will help us to synthesize the available evidence according to the clinical case we are facing. We will use digital biometrics for facial recognition in consultation as a support for the diagnosis of rare diseases. And we will get, we will get used to consulting big data solution to extract information about the real performance of our clinical work in the entire population, perhaps reducing variability in medical practice. What other aspects uh, will change? I think clinical, clinical research will be different. Uh, with COVID-19, we have been we have seen massive data analysis applied to extract epi epidemiological information in the so-called real-world data studies. Also, healthcare management will be able to have clinical data in real time, and decision making will will probably be more based on scientific evidence. But we also uh, face new bioethics challenges related to a greater expectation of what information system will be capable of. So how, how will, would be our work with artificial intelligence? Uh, we will face exponential medicine. It means that physician skills will be enhanced by digital tools. We have to get used to precision medicine, a personalized adjustment of the treatments according to the patient profiles based on analysis powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, the support clinical decision tools uh, were, were be, will be everywhere and interaction with the systems uh, would be more important than now. Enhanced evidence-based medicine uh, will help us to aggregate the valuable knowledge and serve when required. I think, um, quality of care is going to increase and we are going to do what is said to be done. Clinic clinical safety, it's also um, really, uh, it's going to, to, to enhance also and uh, be powered by the artificial intelligence as more accessible clinical information will be available. And uh, the disease screenings using big data analysis will be uh, everywhere. Uh, for, for ending this uh, short presentation, I will say that the internists need to acquire new digital skills to use artific artificial intelligence tools. The introduction of the clinical data in a structured and well-coded form in clinical information systems is the fundamental basis for achieving clinical decision support systems. With the data well digitized, it is possible to conduct big data studies, personalized medicine and exponential medicine. And the development of the innovation in the area of artificial intelligence applied to medicine must take into account aspects of quality of care, patient safety, and bioethics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ismail. Uh, thank you for letting us uh, seek the future. Like I understood that uh, we will leave the question at the end of uh, this webinar, so we will move to the next topic. Okay. So I think uh, I'm what you're saying, I think I'm chairing the next session, is that right? Uh, so it's on digital health. Uh, and I have a co-chair, Flavio, um, but uh, I, I don't think there's much to say. So we've had some really good presentations so far. So let's move on to the first patient. Sorry, the first uh, talk from uh, Guelbato. Please, can you um, share your talk and your wisdom with us, please? Okay. Nice to see you, dear friends. Um, thanks to Ifim and to my dear friend Filomena for inviting me to very interesting uh, webinar. 
uh, I try to share my screen. Okay, please let me see if you see. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, digital health, what we are talking about. Uh, I think that we are talking about a revolution. In this moment, we don't see the... Oh, sorry. Oh, I try to try again. I mean, clearly it wouldn't be a, a webinar on IT without some form of IT failure at some point. So while we're waiting, <laughs> I think... Uh, where you've, it's, it looks like it's kind of quite hopeful. He says you've started screen sharing. There you go, fantastic. There's Tim Cook. Do you see now? Yeah, we can see Tim Cook. The screen, okay. Okay, uh, I try again. Uh, to talk about digital health is in my opinion, to talk about a revolution. Uh, probably, all of you uh, know this guy. It's Tim Cook, the CEO of Health. Um, a couple of years ago and before the COVID pandemic, uh, a reporter asked him what Apple would be remembered for over time. And we could have expected an answer just like the iPhone, the iPad, or something similar. And instead, he replied that improvement in health would be the greatest contribution of the company to mankind. Uh, and there, you can see a first proof of this, a, pub, a paper published uh, a couple of years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, and clearly, uh, sponsored by Apple. Uh, well, there is something that doesn't work. Okay. Uh, but are we ready for this revolution? Uh, it is not easy to understand uh, which is the level of digitalization in Europe and to have an environment able to uh, generate good efforts in this, in this field. But one of the most important and famous score is the uh, DAISY one. Um, and here you can see uh, the ranking for the different country across Europe. Uh, and as an Italian, I mean, obviously, I'm not happy with the result you can see here. Uh, we are at one of the uh, last uh, position in Europe. Uh, I believe that talking about digital health perhaps means uh, shedding some light on terminology. And I will focus on three aspects, digital health, digital medicine, and digital therapeutics. Uh, the term of digital health embraces all technology systems, platform uh, that involve consumers on health related purposes, lifestyle and well-being. Uh, and so is the overall group of, of terms. Digital medicine includes evidence-based software and hardware that measure or intervene uh, for human health. And finally, the last group is digital therapeutics. Uh, digital therapeutics are those um, devices that release a therapeutic intervention. Uh, and one of the most important characteristics of these devices is that 
they have to be strictly and rigorously developed uh, from a clinical point of view, uh, from the clinical point of view of clinical trials. Uh, some examples, examples of digital health. Here you can see uh, a typical app that you can download uh, from the internet store and apps that involve people on lifestyles and well-being. Uh, or platform that capture, store, or transmit health data. A couple of examples of digital medicine. Uh, on one side, you have a wearable that can measure uh, cardiac rhythm. And on the other side, you have artificial pancreas. Uh, in this case, you can both uh, measure uh, glucose levels and at the same time intervene uh, to correct uh, glycemia if needed. And just to give you uh, an idea of the proportion from the quantitative point of view, uh, the cycle in digital health, a subgroup is digital medicine and a very small slice is digital therapeutics, but is also a, a quantitative aspect of the problem. Uh, I will focus my next slides on digital therapeutics, uh, just to share with you what they are and what they are not, and which could be the perspectives for these devices. Uh, as a first step, what they are not. For example, they are not the wellness apps that we download from internet or also uh, door devices that are customized as a support for adherence to therapies. Nor they are integrated drugs with sensors that are activated after ingestion at the gastric level. But what they are? Digital therapeutics are therapeutic intervention in which the active principle is not a molecule, but is a software or an algorithm. Uh, and the most important characteristics from my point of view is that they have to be developed through uh, evidence-based rigorous clinical studies, uh, hopefully randomized clinic, controlled clinical trials. Uh, they have to be authorized by regulatory agency, preferably to be prescribed by physician, and hopefully again, reimbursed by the national health system or by other payers, just like insurance companies, for example. Uh, are digital therapeutics answer for our met needs? Probably yes. Uh, we well know that drugs are often insufficient for most chronic diseases. Uh, on the other side, we have a problem of sustainability as systems are struggling with rising costs of chronic diseases. Uh, regulators and payers are increasingly tending to rely on performance and value-based care. And finally, patients are more and more oriented to uh, want to control their health also through uh, digital devices, smartphone and other ones. But how do digital therapeutics work? Uh, they essentially work uh, modifying and correcting dysfunctional behaviors by the patients. So they act through information, they provide information to patients and or to caregivers. They interact with patients or caregivers. They act on the engagement. So uh, the role of patients and caregivers uh, in the dynamic of digital therapeutics is essential, it's fundamental. Uh, this is a not exhaustive list of indication for these devices. Uh, you can see uh, diseases in the psychiatric field, but also diseases of interest for the internist, for example, arterial hypertension, uh, diabetes, COPD, 
cancer associated symptoms. And this is a list of digital therapeutics already available on the market or in advanced stage of development. And this is a crucial point. Um, in this picture, you can see a sort of schema of uh, research, the different steps for research and development for the ETHICS. And if you analyze this picture, uh, you can find it very similar from a qualitative point of view uh, with the steps for development for drugs, for molecules. Uh, the planning and design and development phase is quite similar to the preclinical phase of the research and development for a new drug. Uh, the blue phase is the clinical one uh, with pilot clinical development and full clinical development to be obtained uh, through confirmatory assessment of efficacy through randomized clinical trials. And finally, after the marketing authorization, we have the post-marketing studies that are probably even more important for DTX than for, for drugs. Uh, and just to give you an example of a clinical evaluation for digital therapeutics. This is a, a product that is uh, aimed at control the abstinence from the use of substances of abuse. And you can see the results of a randomized clinical trials comparing um, the application of this digital therapy in comparison to psychotherapy. And you can see a very significant better results uh, obtained with the digital therapy. Why? Very simple. The digital therapeutic is available daily, uh, once, three, uh, once, twice, three times a day. Uh, on the other side, the face-to-face -face therapy is probably available, okay, once a month or uh, once every two months. So it's a problem of engagement of the patient. Uh, not only efficacy, but also safety. Uh, in this case, you have the results of a trial published on Lancet Digital Health last year and evaluating uh, one approved uh, digital therapeutics for ADHD for children. Um, here you can see some results from the point of view of efficacy, but also the control of safety. Uh, in some patients, we have uh, headache, for example, or uh, uh, frustration. And the most important, um, sorry, the most important um, side aspect for this therapy is uh, tolerance. What happens around the world? Uh, I try to describe the situation in four countries. US, uh, where, as you well know, there is a, the lack of an extensive healthcare system, and this generates a, a different scenario for DTX. Uh, sometimes uh, these therapies are paid directly by user or reimbursed by health insurance or hospital uh, or corporate welfare but for big companies. Very interesting is the experience in uh, UK, uh, the national health system has long since uh, developed an extensive catalog of certified uh, digital health solution, and some of them are available free of charge for, for patients. Uh, in France, uh, in 2019, uh, the country authorized teleconsultation and uh, the reimbursement of one uh, digital therapeutics uh, named Diabio, which is used for diabetes, uh, limited to the case in which it is prescribed as part of a telemedicine program. A very interesting experience is that of Germany. In uh, April 2020, uh, it was launched a program known as DIGA. Uh, and uh, this program um, consider a fast track system uh, 
that ideally has to harmonize the needs of developers. Uh, we have uh, we are dealing with products with a high risk of a rapid obsolescence, so uh, time is very important for these devices. And at the same time, uh, regulation of medical devices. And just to give you an idea, um, less than uh, one year after the launch of the program, 11 uh, digital therapeutics were already approved according to the system and 21 were in the evaluation phase. Uh, in Italy, the situation is not so brilliant. Uh, at the moment, we have no digital therapeutics on the market. Uh, I had the honor to um, coordinate the work of around 40 experts in this field, and we published a book at the beginning of this year. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it's only in Italian language, but work is in progress, an updated version in English and with a more European perspective, we likely we have be available in July, 2021. Uh, the role of scientific societies is very important, fundamental. We have to uh, do education, information. Here you can see a couple of examples, one by the uh, European Society of Cardiology and the other one from the World Psychiatric Association. And so, I'm happy and congratulate HAFIM for the initiative of creating uh, this group um, dedicated to the medicine and he health and um, also the webinar of today. Uh, what will be the successes of this therapy? We don't know it at the moment, but from my point of view, the digital therapeutics may have the characteristics to be uh, a great innovation and to be possibly one of the most important advance uh, in medicine uh, for the next decade. Uh, my take home messages, I said at the beginning that talking about digital health is probably talking about a revolution. Uh, we don't know which is the level of preparedness uh, across Europe for this revolution. Italy probably is not, is not one of the, of the best country from this point of view, but we will try to uh, improve our situation. Uh, sunlight on terminology and therefore education for a care professional is needed. And this perspective, the role of scientific societies is extremely important. And finally, uh, one provocative answer is Digital therapeutics will be and could be the evolution of therapies for 2020 and beyond. And many thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk, uh, a real tour de force, lots of different bits to it, lots of kind of thought provoking uh, areas, which I'm sure we'll discuss in the questions afterwards. Um, so we're going to move on to the kind of the experience right now in Europe and the world. And it's my colleague, um, Professor Sam Shah, uh, who, uh, Sam, why don't you tell him a bit about yourself and uh, then tell us about his talk, because you've got some unparalleled experience of both public and private sector. Hello, thank you uh, very much for having me today. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just briefly, first of all, tell you about myself. So thanks for the invitation. And it's been great to hear uh, so many fascinating discussions Given that it's uh, it's late and we're coming to the towards the end of your fantastic uh, symposia, uh, I will I will try and keep it light and uh, try and lighten my material slightly. But um, I'm Sam Shah. I am the chief medical officer of a digital health company uh, based in the UK. But I was previously the global clinical and digital advisor to the Department for International Trade in the UK and the national director for digital development. Uh, of the NHS. Uh, and aside from that, I'm a clinical academic, mainly working on uh, digital health with Ulster University. And uh, what I'm going to share with you, let's see if I can share, there we go, is uh, just a few uh, concepts and thoughts around digital health, but mainly from the perspective of the consumer. And uh, I appreciate that uh, we've had a lot of discussion so far around 
AI, around uh, concepts, around regulation, reimbursement. And hopefully what I'll be able to do is bring some of that together, but also give you a slightly different perspective from the consumer and the user. So perhaps maybe a starting point for us is what is digital health? Well, I'm sure there are lots of different definitions. We've heard about components of it already this uh, afternoon, this evening. And from my point of view, digital health is an umbrella term that covers four things. It covers infrastructure, technology, and data. It covers telehealth and those platforms that allow people to interact with a clinician. It includes telemedicine. So everything that might involve remote diagnostics, the use of everything from teleradiology to now some of the other emerging areas that might even, may or may not incorporate AI that you heard about earlier. And also mHealth apps and wearables. And I guess the reason these things are all interesting is because uh, we have everything from citizens using some of this technology now, but of course, healthcare settings also using this. And I know earlier on there was a discussion around some of the barriers and challenges, including the, the I word, interoperability. So a bit about what's going on uh, globally. You may already know this, uh, and actually this has been updated, so these are the most recent figures. But globally, we can see that there are now just over 4.6 billion internet users worldwide. There are 5.2 billion unique mobile users, and there are 4.2 billion people that use social media every single day, whether that's citizens, whether that's clinicians, whether that's anyone else, you can see what the power of the internet has done to the world. We have all uh, embraced the digital era through the power of the internet, which seems to drive a lot of what we're expecting in terms of our experiences, but also our expectations around technology, connectivity, and data. So I'll give you an example of the UK just to illustrate this. We can certainly see that 93% of households in the UK have access to the internet. We know that 79% of people do that via uh, access the internet, via a mobile phone or a smart device. So we can see a change in habits moving away from traditional things like the PC. And about 87% of the population of the UK are online every single day. Now these things are important because when we think about introducing digital health into any system in the world, we need to think about digital penetration because that will help determine whether or not it's going to work and be effective in that environment because people may or may not have the accessibility to use these things. If we take a place like the either access to, uh, to in the internet is not equal. You know, there are 9 million people out of 65 million people in the UK that can't use the internet themselves. 7% of the UK are completely offline and 88% do not have, uh, have not used the internet in the last three months. So whilst on the one side, we have the internet and it has driven digitization and access to technology, at the same time, there are still people who uh, don't have access. So when we look globally, we can see digital penetration rates around the world are quite variable. We've got places like the UAE that are the most digitally penetrated places in the world, 99% digital penetration in the United Arab Emirates. We go around to the US, surprisingly, it's a little bit lower at 95%, similar to the UK. Italy similarly at 92%. And so to other parts of the world like China and India, we can see it's much lower. But actually, this is also interesting that it's lower because the type of technology that people use in these places is also greatly variable. We have the legacy in places like the US, the UK and Europe, where people are used to using the PC and smart devices in the traditional way. But if we look at places like India and China, we're seeing the emergence of the voice channel. We're seeing that approximately 56 to 60% of all online activity is happening in those places through the voice channel. And that's interesting because when we're developing technology and we're thinking about what we implement, we do have to think about the channels that users will use, both in terms of the citizen, as well as what works for the clinician. So Gartner predict that by 2020, 30% of all web browsing was going to be done without a screen. Well, we haven't quite got there, 
And uh, perhaps Gartner would have been right, but perhaps the uh, pandemic got slightly in the way of this. But certainly we can see a trend that web browsing is changing. People are moving away from it being done on a, on a screen in the traditional sense, but actually to using other channels like the voice channel. So we can see digitization and digital as a route to reducing health inequalities if we can get the access model right. And if we can get the facilities, the infrastructure and the, and the actual systems right. But it doesn't sort of stop there. We can see there's a massive trend globally around the technology. And this is a massive challenge for regulators, for those people deciding on reimbursement, and also for those that are interested in the safety. And certainly across Europe, we see the problem around, uh, or the problem or the challenge around the implementation of the MDR and what is and isn't classified as a device and the point at which the regulator does or doesn't step in. At what point in places like Germany do we decide to reimburse something or not if we think about DIGA and digital therapeutics? And what about the place like the UK where we already have an NHS apps library but it isn't actually any more universal and we could end up with a postcode lottery as we call it, almost an inequality in itself due to the assessment of apps. So we do know that age is a big factor when people go online and use things and services that they are engaging with online. And this is a big factor as to whether or not somebody will go online and do anything online. And the same applies in healthcare. But it's not, it's not an equal distribution of age as an issue because of course, those people in the least deprived communities might still use digitization as a route to access healthcare. When we look over at apps as a whole, and we think about the entire economy of apps, and there's almost 366,000 healthcare applications globally. But only, you know, if we look at 80% of those, they fall below the quality thresholds that we would aspire to when we want to have applications that are used. When we assess those applications amongst standards that are used both in the UK, but some of which are used internationally, many of those applications aren't useful. When we think about the different people that search for those apps, how will they know whether or not something is useful or not? When we think about consumer digital health, this is very important. And what about the rapid rollout of technology? Is it safe? Is it effective? Certainly during the period of COVID and now people living long COVID, we know that people are more likely to use digital health, healthcare applications, technology, connected devices, but is it safe? Is it effective? And who is deciding if it's safe or effective? And how does an unknowing consumer know? And how does a clinician know when they prescribe this or recommend a product? It's a real challenge and something we're certainly seeing in all parts of the world. So a bit about what's happening out there in uh, society that we sort of see more generally. We know that 5 million people every day are downloading a healthcare application. That's 25% higher than before the COVID period. And you can download this report. There's a company called Orca in the UK that operates globally. And they, this report is available on their site. You'll find this data there. We know that uh, if we look at the, the 10 largest English language mental health wellness apps, for example, there were 10 million downloads in April 2020 alone. So we're seeing an increase in the download of these sorts of products, uh, increasingly so since the COVID-19 period. And we also find that with apps, surprisingly, age is not a barrier to adoption. Of course, there's a difference between who uses them what age, but we are seeing a wide demographic of users across the age spectrum. And certain apps, of course, now consumer facing apps have, of course, increased in valuation because of their utility. And that dimension is important because, of course, as app providers recognize there's value in their apps, of course, they want the utility to increase. And that is a real barrier for regulators themselves because they don't want to be seen to be damaging the economy but because of the pressures from global governments, but at the same time, they want citizens to be safe. So one thing that we do see is healthcare providers themselves are also seeing the opportunity. 40% believe that technology can reduce the number of visits. 93% of healthcare providers know that healthcare apps can improve patients' health. And these, this is important when we think about the healthcare environment. Will we see apps come in to the acute setting, into the hospital setting. But we're sure we're all seeing this in our own workplaces, but we're seeing the blend of apps being used by citizens in their own homes, as well as those recommended by clinicians, as well as those used in an acute setting. And this isn't unique to the UK or Europe, but we're seeing this trend globally. But what happens with reimbursement, standards, and regulation? This is really hard 
So we look at places like Germany, of course, as a reimbursement model, but I think at this stage, there's only 11 digital therapeutics that have been put onto that framework. We look at the UK as a model where there isn't any reimbursement, but of course there was an apps library designed in the NHS that met certain standards. And if we look at other places like Belgium, for example, there's a three tier system that seemed to be much more sensitive to the different levels of standard that should be applied. Should there be regulation? Shouldn't there? Who should decide? This is still unresolved and it varies across global economies. What could be the future though? I've just touched on the fact that applications, therapeutics, technology are coming not only to patients' homes, but also blending in the acute environment. This is Mercy Virtual, which is one of the most well-known hospitals that uses technology in the US. And this is a hospital without any beds. There's not a single bed in Mercy Virtual. In, uh, in Mercy Virtual, they, uh, they have doctors and nurses, but not a single bed. They remotely monitor all their patients. Could this be the future of healthcare? Is there a future environment where technology will be operating in this way, where people will be at home and clinicians will go into patients' own homes? Perhaps that might be a place we get to. But along the way, there are probably a few other examples. If we take this hospital in uh, Taiwan, this is a great example where they started this journey. They're using IoT, they've implemented 5G. It's a bit of a buzzword right now, but they've seemed to have found a use case for it that works for them and has an outcome. They've used components of AI. Now I've used this very broadly here, but of course AI used in different ways for the patient experience as they enter the system through to using it around key, key areas of diagnostic like radiology. And ironically, this hospital is also energy efficient in its use of technology, a different use case, one that's important when we think about environment and inequalities. What about this hospital in Belgium that some of you might be familiar with? They've been known as a case study for using cloud-based energy and sustainability platforms. Again, that's an environmental use. Wi-Fi for personal control by patients over their conditions in which they are uh, 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 inpatients, perhaps. Wearable tags that can be deployed to monitor vital signs and, uh, and, and automate some of the rec recovery env environment, similar to what could be done at home. Like this hospital in Canada, they've used digitization technology in a different way. They've used automation to maximize the efficiency and try and help promote patient outcomes not really focusing on technology in the clinical environment so much, but more around the flow through a hospital and the use around processes in the organization. They've automated their supply chain, for example, and physicians and clinicians working in this environment can use technology to order tests, deliver samples, and receive results completely electronically. So a different use case, but definitely 100% wireless on-site communications. But these are all cases of different levels and degrees of digitization. I suppose I go back to my opening point. Digital health is an umbrella term. Different parts of the world, different settings will be using it to a different extent, depending on the degree of digital penetration, the type of infrastructure they might have, their entire movement on interoperability, but most importantly, digital literacy of their population, digital literacy of their workforce. And these factors play out not only in the UK, not only Europe, but globally. But thank you for listening. Happy to take some questions afterwards. We can connect with me online through uh, Twitter or you can email. But uh, great joining you today and uh, very much best of luck with the rest of the conference. Well, uh, right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, compliments for the clear and complete report. And uh, now, considering that we are very late, uh, I introduce Francisco Javier Ascon. Uh, a member of uh, Spanish uh, Digital Health uh, who will speak about uh, future prospective in digital health. Hello, um, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I, I want to, two news, one good news and one bad news. The bad news is that everything I'm going to say probably has been said before. And the good news is probably I'm not going to say something different. So really, it uh, confrontates me. Uh, I'm going to share presentation. Uh, okay, it's okay. I think so. Okay. Um, 
the thing I'm trying to, to, to give some future perspective on, on digital health. And uh, as I said before, probably everything's been said, but I, I want to give uh, like a glue to, to conglomerate a, a few concepts to try to understand everything um, about the whys. Uh, if you know Simon Sinek is one of the top leaders in leadership, in, in influence in, in leadership. I like very much the, the golden circle. The golden circle is like um, is the figure you see here. Um, and it points to, to, to an interesting concept. The concept is that we know everything about the what and the hows. The what is the artificial intelligence, digital health, telemedicine, small watches, everything, all the gadgets that we know. And even we know a lot about the hows, how we are going to implement all this technology. But we have to know exactly why we must do this to understand the future of what we are doing this. If you understand the why, you understand the value it brings and the problems it solves. Um, I assure that digital health must bring value, must solve problems must do something we cannot do right now with the analogic technology. It's important to distinguish before um, between informatics and digitalization because informatics, if you put a printer on, on every, uh, every place, it doesn't mean that you can do something different. And the point here and the, the, the aim here is to do different things. We don't want digital health because it's something really cool, really modern, really funny. We are freaky technology guys who really like everything about technology. No, we want digital health because it is necessary, as I will try to demonstrate. Uh, it is not really a fancy tool just to fix something about our digital, uh, our health system. It's the foundation for to build a new health system. Um, we don't know the same things to in, in a different way. We do, we must do different things because we want to solve problems. And that's why uh, digital tools can really help to build a new, a new system. And how? Um, all we talk about data, big data, artificial intelligence, the internet, everything. Um, it's a paradox, but the more technology, if you use technology in a proper way, you can get a more human and a more uh, better medicine for humans. Because if you let the machines do the machines work, people can do people's work. Doctors, nurses, and all the health professionals can do a more human work when machines are in control of all the things that like to control machines. And what can we get? Um, I just will give you just a three samples. The, the examples are, are infinite, but just how can, can we get? We can get the patient empowerment. We can get a new redesign, a new rethinking of the system. And we can point to what's called personalized medicine. At the end of the day, we are trying, we, we are, you know, the, the work of uh, Ray Hood that a few years ago um, wrote this paper. And I, I like this very much, the, the, the 4P, the P4 medicine, the predictive, personalized, preventive, and participative. Uh, the research is about cancer in this paper, but I think is uh, related to all medicine, where we must go. We are in a reactive system. We are reactive. We are prepared to assess a disease. We are not really, we, we don't have a really health system. We have a disease system because we are prepared to uh, assess disease. And um, the point here is to get more health, to avoid disease, not to only just treat diseases. Uh, the four piece points to predictive because in some way we, we want to, to anticipate 
health problems. We don't want the compensation. We don't want the people to reach to the hospitals. We want to avoid the disease. We want to avoid the people going to the emergency rooms. Personalized because um, we all are different and probably it's not the same. Uh, there's no point to treat the same anemia in a patient 20 years old than someone with 95 years old. That's impossible to treat the same way or to, to, to get to the same conclusions. Preventive, because we now we have the power to control habits, to control the way we use genetics. And participative, because we need the patient to get into our decisions. We want the patient in our team. How we can get this patient empowerment with the, the first point? Um, three, three, three concepts. First is shared decisions. Before all the data, all the technology, all the studies, and all the information just were in position of physicians, of doctors, of just health professionals. Now, all this information is also shared with patients, and patient has decision, and patient has needings, and patients has priorities. And it's a very good opportunity to share all this information to help patients to decide the best option for them. It's not that they decide what treat is better, no. Is we help people with all this information available to get to the point they want to get. Um, the shared medical records is uh, clinical record is just a reality in 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 different countries. I think in the, in the U.S. and uh, people has access to all his information because we can we we need to remember that. Information belongs and data belongs to patients, not to the system, to patients. In this regard, the social networks, I think, is really, really a critical point. Patients are in social networks. They are a few years long. And doctors and um, health professionals are so shy to get into the network and to share knowledge and to, to give opinion. And it's a, it's a critical point because um, there is a different space that is in the net where the interaction between professionals and patients is so, so, so rich and so critical and, and so helpful in some way. We need this, the technology can make these collaborative networks work and um, just empower patients with the right knowledge. As said before, it's important to consider the patient journey. The patient journey, as I like very much this, this, this graphic, this, this paper. Um, we must consider that when a patient interacts with the system, is it easy? Is it efficient? Is it kind? How long does it take to, to give a, a, an answer to, to solve the problem? Does it really solve the problem the patient has? Um, the classical uh, patient journey sometimes is really uh, it's, it's painful. Sometimes it gets a lot of time to get response. Sometimes you have to visit very different doors, very different rooms, very different, different hospitals, different uh, interviews. The question here is how can we do it much better? How can we do with, we can optimize all the circuitries and remove what is really useless. No? Um, this example is quite easy. At the beginning of the problem, the, the patient must reach a point to get an answer to, the, to their needs. No? Second point, uh, how we can this, this or how technology can do this liquid health, this liquid um, environment to, to, to connect. For just four points here. First, no more silos. You know what a silo is. It's uh, all the buildings, all the structures in the, in, in the health system are fragmented. We are, don't connect with each other. We don't connect without, within, uh, between hospitals and even inside our hospitals are difficulties to connect with different departments. But we need to break all this fragmented reality. We need just one structure and technology can glue everything. 
and stick together all the spare parts and just make us one, really one structure that serves all. We need a connected, that work in parallel and in a collab collaborative job. Uh, you know that we have a lot of information losses, the, the redundancy of, of workflows, the patients, the patients in time are, are lost in all the system, and we need to just to create one one solid structure. Second, no levels, just attention, because we are doing the you know the primary care first level secondary level, hospitals of third level, this kind of a structure, this kind of is, is like a, a building base attention. It's like you go to a superstore and to reach to the fifth floor, you have to go to the first, second, third. First, you go to the GP, second, you maybe you go to another specialist and this specialist just send you to another one. The, the question here is we have to rethink the primary care. Uh, imagine that if you use not just, of, of course, a, a physical consultation, if you use chatbots, if you use a teleconference, tele, 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 video, video calls, the, the, the options of the primary care really increases a lot. And it makes more resolutive because we just, with one call, we can give a more accurate response. We can go to the fifth floor, that is the right floor, without going to the first, the second, and the third floor. Third point, we need to reconsider that first, now we have, when we need something about the health system, we, we have some problem. First, we want to go, or we need to go to a building, we need to go to a place, but now the only thing we have to do first is just ask, ask a question, ask what's your problem? ask what you need and the system should give you the response and maybe it's no need to go to any place as I said before as well th this is the end of one fits all because uh, now it's like the system uh, is trying to figure out what if you need something maybe we have something for you maybe we have something for your problem but this is not that I really real solution for anything. The question here is what you really need, what you really need depending on who you are and who are your needings. And now technology can bring you all this together. And finally, what about personalized medicine? Uh, the more we know about uh, the biology or the multiple scales of biology, the, the biology systems, the more accurate we can give an answer because uh, we can point directly to where the problem is and maybe we can understand what the solution is without the, all the collateral effects. The point here is to preserve the health, is to, to maintain health and not to avoid just disease. I just, we will give you four examples very, very fast. Um, not to, uh, there are a lot of, of examples of this, but just to give you just a hint of what I'm trying to say. The first uh, level is nutrigenomics, and as I said before, it, it's the more we know about how we are, how we are made of, how we work, how we run, how our systems are built, the more we can do, uh, the more we can offer about, of course, food, better food for you, what the food you can eat, therefore you don't need to eat, and how we can do the prescriptions or the, the drugs we prescribe more precise just for you, not for everyone, not the same tablet for everyone, just for you. This drug is not for you, this dose is not for you, this kind of pill is not for you, maybe for me. 3D and 4D printing, I think there's endless examples of the application of 3D in printing in, in medicine, dentistry, tissues, tissue models, medical devices. Now the surgeons can really build a special device for this operation, for your operation, and this is really amazing. They can build anatomical models and they even can, uh, pharmacists can do drug formulation just in 3D, and that's really, a very, very interesting realm. 
But even more, we have 4D printing. We have we print with different materials. We have memory. And these materials can uh, react to some triggers, for example, temperature, pH, light, and they can modify the response. And we can control different environments just with these materials. That's really amazing. Lifestyle medicine. And uh, I said before as well, uh, we think about the determinants of health. And uh, there is a surprise, medical care, all these big structures, hospitals, beds, everything, just 11% of the results of health. What matters most is habits, genetics, and social uh, environment. But now we can go far beyond the hospital. We can control habits with all these smartwatches, smart devices, smartphones, we are connected. We can control all the genetics. We know more about genetics than ever, and we can control our social interactions. And of course, we can know a lot about the environment, and we try to control all these different determinants of health. Far beyond hospital, there is a lot of health that we can control right now. And finally, the world trials. What mean with this? Uh, what do I mean? Um, before you have your disease, you have to find the, the doctor, maybe near, if you're lucky in your place. But now we can share the knowledge. We can share the knowledge and we, maybe the doctor is just the full, uh, the full world. You can find your doctor to any place, to any time. We can share the knowledge. And maybe you can find even your trial in any place in the world. So the expectations, the possibilities of treatment are much, much better. Just to my take home messages, three points. I think that digital health is just necessary to make the change towards a more efficient, secure and human medicine, not just a tool to fix something. Digital health comes to rebuild the system, not to improve the present one. And uh, it makes real the 4P medicine that I truly believe in. Predictive, preventive, personalized, and participative. Just a quote about Jack Well, I love this quote. If the rate of change on the outside exists, the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And just want you to, to think on the technology we carry on in our pockets with our smartphones and consider if we can do the same things in our work, in our hospitals, in our environment. Think about that. Thank you very much. You can, some, we can travel, you can to my place, to Mallorca. I will invite you to this beautiful bar and we can discuss in profundity all this, this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, we have uh, time for uh, one question. No question. I have a question for Francisco. Um, okay, uh, the uh, digital health uh, can be a uh, union for uh, the specialist uh, uh, also for uh, patient and specialist. Yeah. Call a new step a digital health uh, to unit specialist with each other and around the patients. Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, uh, digital health can uh, uh, can be a uh, um, a system for uh, union between uh, specialists. Oh yeah, I think so. Um... Uh, I mean, that technology it brings us the opportunity to, uh, to, to work, of course, to share the knowledge, to, to share the, 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 the work environment and try to, to, to fill the gaps between the actual system. I mean, one question here is that um, imagine that you have um, the, the, the data of, the, of one patient 
Now each share is scattered. Every hospital has their own information system. But imagine that you can put all this information in just one place, one repository, and that just the doctors just are work with this only file, only system, only uh, repository of data. The, the way all the specialists can share together, can work together, is just to share the same information. We, we need to share the same information about the same patient, and we need to, um, to avoid duplication. We need to avoid, we, we want to, I think in some way we need to learn to cooperate because we are used just to see our part of the patient, but not the full patient. And maybe internists are different in some way, no? because we like to, to look the full picture of, 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 of medicine. But I think that at the end of the day, the point here is, is to, to, to create only just one space when all we can work together. And I think that technology can bring this. It's like uh, now we are sharing the, this conference. Now we are talking with WhatsApps, with Telegrams, with social networks. The only thing we, we just to put all this technology into the medical perspective, I think so. Thank you, thank you. Filomena, for the conclusion. Okay, I give the uh, the, the, the role of uh, Luis Campos to say something uh, to for the conclusion, and after I will give to you the take home messages of all the webinar. Uh, please, Luis. Uh, Many thanks, Filomena. So good afternoon to everybody. I will take only one minute, and I will give the I will give the stage to you. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for the creation of this important working group of FEFIM. And thanks to all the speakers, because uh, there were uh, fantastic uh, um, uh, presentations. Very few messages, telegraphic messages. First, this pandemic boosted uh, the, the digital health. But in many countries, we had not an infrastructure built to face the challenges of the change that we have had in our countries. Second, um, the information and communications technology has, uh, have a bright side and a dark side. They solve many problems, but also they create other problems. The question of uh, quality that uh, Sam Shah uh, uh, said, more than 80% of the more than 300,000 apps, they don't have enough quality. They don't uh, accomplish the min minimum levels of uh, quality. The third, uh, the digital health is a tool they cannot, it cannot integrate what is separated. And uh, in reality, in many of our countries, the health organizations, the levels of care are fragmented and separated. It can be a tool, it can help, but it cannot uh, integrate what is separate. The fourth is um, about uh, the need of patient feedback. Really, patient feedback is fundamental, but also professional feedback. Because unfortunately, we see many softwares that uh, are not adapted to our reality, are not adapted to our uh, medical practice. And second, I thought uh, uh, this message of Professor Kuhn very, very important. We have to rethink medicine. And uh, it's a huge, huge challenge that we face to join our experience, our intuition, the patient-doctor-patient relationship 
with the use of all these devices and the digital health that uh, uh, that we have, that we have and uh, also from Gussoni, Alberto Gussoni, it was very interesting this um, issue about the digital therapeutics, uh, where the drug is an algorithm. It's a very appealing idea, and I think he is right. It's one of the major um, progresses that we have uh, we can do. And finally, and as you know, as you see, I'm being very quick, very fast. I think this, uh, uh, this message from Francisco is very, very important. We know the what, we know the, the how, and we have to know the why. Why we want to implement digital health. And we have to prove that it benefits the patients, that it increases quality, that increases efficiency, that it improves uh, outcomes and that it decreases inequity. And uh, that is very important. So it was a pleasure to be here to participate and many thanks to Phil Mena by this invitation. I'm the chair of the Quality and Professional Issues uh, Subcommittee of FIM. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to have uh, co-chaired with you because uh, as you, you could see, uh, the, the conclusion, the take home message are really very close to yours. So it means that we are very close also in the in our I mean the meaning of of this seminar of this webinar and the meaning of digital health. So this is very encouraging for me because it is it, I think it my experience with this working group is very new, but I find really very close to foreign people, eh? foreign uh, researchers. And uh, I think it's, uh, I am uh, very, very happy to collaborate with you and to share uh, our ideas. I think it's a very, a very important for us. And Thanks. just, uh, I, I will go to the, um, uh, to the final uh, messages and uh, click on messages webinar. Ah, I can click on. Uh, oh dear, I, I lose my final message. Ah, this one. This one. Okay. Do you see the the presentation? Yes. Okay. So. Okay. So take on messages and. Uh, just like the, I, I want to tell you the take home messages for each of the topics we we we, uh, we had this uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first one is telemedicine offers flexibility, convenience, and lower cost uh, uh, if targeted and managed correctly. And the patient feedback is essential. Uh, and this is a one point very important that was uh, underlined also by. Luis Campos and also uh, I find very interesting also this uh, sequence uh, sequence creating an opportunity and implementation uh, support and quality surveillance and also this point of quality was was a point very underlined by all the speakers. And uh, we continue also with telemedicine. Digital transformation describes an increasing super convergence of traditional medicine with information and biotech biotechnologies. So we, we, we need not to, uh, to, to consider always traditional medicine and traditional relationship between doctor and the patient. COVID-19 crisis has, has become a catalyst for digital change. And also this concept was underlined by many speakers this uh, afternoon. And especially for people with chronic diseases, integration in interim care is ongoing. And this is a one point very important for us, for, for us that are internists. So chronic diseases is a, a, a central point of our work. And uh, passing to uh, artificial intelligence, uh, 
um, the points are extending the scope of e-consultation to include a physical examination, that said uh, Michael, uh, supporting the physician with artificial intelligent algorithm and uh, starting an e-conference platform for the physician to consult patients from a special clinical center. And also, um, interns need to acquire new digital skills. So, what another important point was the, the education, education uh, of the internet and in general of the the introduction of a clinical data and structure, the well coded form in clinical information system is a basis for achieving clinical decision support tools. Uh, when the, the data were digitalized, it's possible to conduct big data studies, personalized medicine. Also, this point was very well explained in, in, the, in the presentation. And uh, also the development of innovation applied to medicine must take into account uh, aspects of quality of care, patient safety and bioethics. And also this point I think is very important. It was underlined by uh, many speakers. And uh, going uh, uh, to digital uh, health, uh, I found very interesting the uh, Alberto presentation, and uh, I wanted to uh, rethink about this one, uh, about the differences between digital health, and digital medicine, and digital therapeutics that is uh, that requires experimental clinical efficacy trials. So this is very important, I think, for us. Uh, to want to better understand the meaning of, uh, of the words and uh, digital health is necessary to make the change towards a more efficient, secure and human medicine and so the patient's empowerment, digital health come to rebuild the system, also this was a very important uh, take on message, liquid health and cultural redesign and uh, the last one, personalized medicine uh, that makes real the, P, the, the 4P uh, medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participative. So uh, I want to, to say you, to you hello with these uh, uh, words, uh, let the machine do the machine work so the humans can do the human work. And thank you very much for uh, uh, to all the speakers, the moderator, all the participants. I think it was a very, very important starting point for our FM working group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 See you very soon eh, to all the FIM working group uh, participants. Eh? We just start to work again. Eh? <laughs> okay. Bye. Good job. Bye. Bye, -bye. Oh, you, are, oh, you are with us. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye, Luis. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye.